All right. Uh, you never know what. Big guest, big guest this week, Whitney Cummings. Can I just pee? <laughs> um, um, would you like some limeade? Have you ever had any? You, what is it? You've never had limeade? Of, of course I've had limeade. Oh, I, some people haven't. You're from Ohio, right? Yes. You get A lot of people don't know about limeade. You know, I looked up your Wikipedia and your genre said observational comedy, and now I know why. <laughs> is the light on you, Whitney? <laughs> don't you love how since I got pregnant I started dressing like Esther? I'm not noticing that. Really? No. No, I don't notice much. Can you much. just validate my reality? Oh, that's a good thing. And yes. <laughs> I thought you were being self-deprecating. No, I just, I never wear like sweatpants on podcasts. I try to kind of pull it up, but now I kind of get why they do it. <laughs> Headphones might be good. They, sometimes it calms me down because I hear my own voice and I'm like, ah, stop yelling. Yeah, wear them then. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Do us a favor, Whitney. Uh, all right, go ahead. All right, good. Let me, uh. You guys, Rick is in the bathroom. Uh, I thought you might want to know. In his bathroom, he, <laughs> he has a, a tissue box that is a house, and the tissue comes out of the chimney. Welcome back to another episode of Take Your Shoes Off. Today, our special guest is, one more time, Whitney Cummings. Theme music. Scoot doo, blabbity blue. Get this over with. This is tough, tough times. How are the levels here? How are we? How 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 do I sound here? Is this good? I can't tell when we're going and when we're not. But do you want me to test? Yeah. Is that where you're gonna have the microphone that far away? Is that okay? Oh, see, this is why your podcast sounds so good. You do things like this. Yeah. Go go here. Higher. Mm -hmm. Is this so you could Photoshop it in later? Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, uh, and I mean this as a compliment. You're the first guest. I think I'll lower the levels a little. Okay. Mine too, though. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm ch I'm chill. I'm 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 calming down as a person in general. Oh, that 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 did that bother you when I said that? This is a very uh, soothing environment. Yeah. I don't feel defensive. Let's let's talk about that. Do you normally okay. feel defensive? Particular, I, I, it's more like when I, oh my God, I'm fucking getting, no, come on, let me get a getting couple trolled let me get, by your face. Do you normally feel defensive? Come on, let me get a couple bits. I, then. <laughs> were you the guy in high school that when you would go to like games, you would like hold floaties up to while the opposing team was shooting free throws? No, I was on the bench cheering on my friends. Oh, okay. I was on the basketball team. Maybe do that right now. <laughs> I think you dress just like <laughs> Esther. And um, we'll have to bring her her levels up in post because we could barely hear. Okay, so is this okay? What about yeah, this good. level? This is, this is just my voice. I've had to accept it. I, I'm trust me. I'm as bummed out as you guys are. I'm sorry about it. Um, I'll have to accept it at some point. But no, I I feel like it's taken a while for us to do this. We Thanks for asking me. Okay, is that better? You do this every day, every week. I I mean, yes. Uh, is this good? That is good. Okay, great. Yeah, we've been. Uh, it's been. Uh, I don't know. Have we been trying to do this? Because we never even really talked mm, about it. Not really. But let me just answer your question. I think I'm still not clear what's expected of me on a podcast. And I think there's oftentimes Ooh. you're like, oh, I need to be funny and I need to have energy. But I think everybody's is different. Mm -hmm. And obviously your uh, fans come for comedy, but also poignant stuff and incisive all of it. What but was that last one? Incisive? Incisive insight. I don't know. What and do you think people want from you? I mean, honestly, I think I'm still uh, not able to wrap my head around this, like being a comedian and not trying to be funny every 20 seconds, you know, or like not trying to, I'm kind of like, are we being vulnerable? We're talking about our depression. Is this, if we do, should we be funny about it? I don't, I'm still kind of figuring out how people consume podcasts, why and all of it. Well, I, um, can I solicit a little advice? Please. It's something that I also am like conscious of and I'll talk about it when I talk about it. But I think the main thing is to stay away from talking about what it is we're supposed to be talking about. Sure. I think people don't like that. Sure. But, Fair enough. Just opening with an insecurity because you asked me how loud I was going to be, I guess. Yeah, I... Uh, yeah, I guess I never, I didn't think about that, and, and and I should have taken that in consideration. And for Whitney, I am so sorry I did. I that. am go, not going to forgive go, you because that go, didn't go, feel go, sincere. Go. Um, 
<laughs> so it's, you know, what I'm realizing right now is uh, we've known each other for a long time, but mm-hmm. we don't know each other. Uh, complete strangers. Um, I did do a little bit of research. But we also know each, I feel like, don't you think that comics, like we sort of also have this, we've known each other for a thousand years nope. in some way, Mm-mm. but we both do something that very few people do. So it's like, we understand, like I could be with someone for 10 years married and you'll kind of know me more intimately in one way because you've, you're a stand up. I don't subscribe to that. Mm-hmm. I know people think that way. I know Seinfeld thinks that way. Okay. Um, I think we're all we're all different. Like it says here, you went to college. Is that correct? Uh, correct. See, um, now another thing I found <laughs> interesting is that uh, I already saw that you're an observational comedian, but that's really all I know about you. <laughs> I hate um, you. <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Liquid IV. Grab your Liquid IV hydration multiplier. It's sugar-free, and you can buy it in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code TISO at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order at liquidiv.com, code TISO. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash TISO today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash TISO to get 10% off. Esther. Esther. What? Will you do uh, an, the commercial with me for later in this episode? Yeah, I'm doing it. I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> I had that, that idea. I did that on stage once years ago. And then I had that idea. And I was planning on asking you a bunch of questions <laughs> and then eventually turning it. But I also realized I don't know. I don't have questions. <laughs> do you not? It seems like you prepare Depends a lot for your podcast. Guess. Okay. Depends on the guest. Got it, got it, got it, got it. But you also are a very naturally inquisitive person. I'm a curious boy. Yeah. I feel like the, the couple times we've uh, spent time together... Uh, I'm always sort of fascinated. But I'm always kind of jarred because I think- Why did you switch from fascinated to jarred? Fascinated was a compliment. Both, 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 both. Okay. Both two things okay. can be true at once. And give me a fascinated, give me a jarred. I was, I'm fascinated by you. Okay. But also maybe a little bit thrown because you're like me where you'll just start asking questions and in, maybe it's just in LA or whatever, people tend to not ask you a lot about yourself or it's usually what are you working on? And I remember when we first hung out, you were asking me like actual questions. And I was like, when we first I hung couldn't out, tell if you were mocking me. And I, I was like, I uh, was thrown. Wow. And it's not that you did anything weird. I, I think everybody else is weird that they never ask anyone questions. Like I, we've known people in our business where I'm like, I don't know where you're from, homie. Like I know nothing about you, but I see you every night. Yeah, I know where you're from. But just remind me. Uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah. Well, Virginia. not you weren't born in D.C. You were I was born in, born in D.C. And but moved to Virginia. Moved to Virginia, yeah. Why are you writing? I just keep a notes for, for in post. <laughs> and, and, and when you moved to Virginia, when you were how old? Uh, I lived there half the time uh, from about 11. Uh, as a teenager, mm-hmm. I lived in Roanoke, Virginia. And then I went back and forth summers and stuff. Now, what made you uh, move? Was it a, a job that you uh, got as a kid? Parents were not equipped to parent, so they would send us to live with our aunts. And then, uh, uh, real quick, are your mom's sisters, your dad's sisters, or both? Dad's sisters. Dad's yeah. Sisters. So got to go live on a farm, which was very cool, um, which I'm grateful for. So I went from like a very urban environment to a very rural environment. So I'm black gonna... to white. Black environment to white environment. Mm-hmm. It, Why are people so combative with me on podcasts? <laughs> All right, let's get into it. When I was talking about levels, I wasn't I wasn't icing you out. Uh-huh. When we first met and you thought I was making fun of you, I was actually going through a breakup and you were helping me out and I was asking real questions. And right now, I, I called out that I didn't have any questions prepared. So I was an- asking some of the most simple, though I'm interested, simple interview questions. Now, where are you from? <laughs> That's interesting how your mother was. And I'm just joking around. And you, you're taking it as me being compatible. With and I'm thinking, this is how I connect, baby. I'm just doing silly I've bits. listened to other episodes of your podcast. They oh, don't start like this. Pull up this. the text of her asking me if I have cameras. <laughs> how many have you listened I to? I listened to. I just listened to um, Sam Morrell. Uh, I just listened to Mark Norman. I mean, I was just, you know, popping around. Yeah, but I always want to know what I'm walking into. Okay. Because I feel like it's like a lot of us, we don't get to listen to each other's podcasts because we're doing our own podcasts. And then like, it's just, and then you go on someone's and you're like, I'm just trying to do what they. I want to stick on the track of me, your people being compatible with you. But I was giving you a, a compliment about when we met. I was blown away by your sincerity. And I think in our business, sincerity sometimes comes off odd. Don't you think? Um, I have a circle of friends that, uh, are sincere, Mm -hmm. like 
I have had a few friends um, for a decade now, and they're not my only friends. Mm -hmm. I have, we have lots of comedians and friends and phone numbers and lunch if it happens, but like right. Brent Morin, John DeWalt, David Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Great dudes. I don't know anybody else. Great dudes. Um, and I have know, a lot of connected conversations. Did you know Brent's brother is a professional ballerina? Ice skater. Sorry. Ice ballerina. Chili ballerina. Um, he talks about it all the time. Oh, does he? <laughs> I don't know if that's a mean thing to say because I'm saying how much I love him. But if you were in that situation, wouldn't you talk about, about it all the time? I'd either never bring it up or talk about it constantly. My brother's a Jeopardy champion. You, what? I bet you never knew that. By the way. Because I don't talk about that kind of stuff. That makes sense. I bet you would be a Jeopardy champion if you wanted to be. Uh, my brother's a different kind of kind of smart than me. Yeah. My brother's photographic memory, brilliant. Wow. And I just... Do you have a photographic memory? Well, I did draw this <laughs> <laughs> without even looking at your Instagram. I feel like I did look like that season two of Whitney. <laughs> um, when I have people, oh, also we'll get this for a second. Um, two things. One, you're a successful alpha woman. Two, you are silly. So when you're around a silly person, mm -hmm. they're either going to submit or they're going to play back. Right, right. So if they submit, then it's going to be boring. Mm -hmm. And if they play back, your feelings are going to get hurt. Go, 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 go. So like that, did that just? No, I just thought something, which is, I don't know if I get my feelings hurt with comedians. I mean, I, I definitely have in the past, but now I try not to take it too personally. Um, you know, I but. I just thought of something. Yeah, go. No, 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 no. Please. No, no. I'm sorry. Do you, go. Are you going to do Neuralink if it happens? Um, no. Okay. Because I feel I'm like almost there already, brains yeah. like ours, like I do not want people seeing like what it looks like. <laughs> but no, but please go on that. You're not, you're not, uh, your feelings are hurt. That used to be hurt, but. No, I think it's like, because I think podcasts are slightly different because and I know we're not going to be masturbatory and talk about what we're talking about. Um, and you know, but it's like when we're at. <laughs> When we're at uh, comedy clubs and we're sort of being silly or we're on set, but then sort of when we get the podcast space, I'm kind of like, are we doing bits? Are we right. not doing bits? And you know, it's kind of always bits. Switch. I, I'm always bits. But bits, and I want to make this as some merch because I've said this a couple of times. Jokes and sincerity are not mutually exclusive. Concur. And doing some bits and doing some bits and, right. and some bits. I love it. Yeah. So always bits. Yeah. I don't do, I don't have friends that were not doing bits more than half the time. Sure. Uh, ditto. There's no other kind. But also sometimes I'm like, oh, on a podcast, if you're talking for an hour and a half, like, does it get annoying? Does it get yes. obnoxious? Yes. Does it get monotonous? So yes. it's like finding that balance, I think. Yeah, all of it. You have, you've found it very well. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I found it as much as I accepted the fact that this is going to be one to two hours of our week, whatever we are experiencing and feeling today, and then watch it if you want. These, this isn't a special. Uh-huh. You know, right. it's just, and 80% of the topics you've talked about a hundred times and I've talked about a hundred times, mm -hmm. but I don't know. But not with each other. I think for me, it's like, I mean, listening to Sam talk to you, I think a lot of what, at least I'll speak for myself, I tune into is like, oh my God, like Rick and Mark Maron, I can't wait to see what this mix does. Even if they talk about something, I've heard them both talk about a million times. That's, that's what's fun about this to me. The, uh, when I was in the weeds, because this is a lot of work mm -hmm. and like resenting it a little bit and like yeah. looking for what I like, because how much money was I making before? I'm making a little bit now, but like, why am I doing this? And the thing that I realized is I get to have that connection every week with somebody. Yep. And you get to monetize it. You don't have to waste your time doing it in person in the hallway. Remember, yeah, remember yeah, when people we said you want to go get a coffee? It's like, if, if I mean, <laughs> what, what, are, what kind of ads are we getting? <laughs> That's insane. Like, I mean, people are like, comedy's gotten so weird and toxic. And I'm like, yeah, we are now monetizing our conversations. And like, you know, because I think to your point, you may, may disagree because it goes along the thread of the Seinfeld, the way that, that he views comics. But I do think there was something to be said for us being able to attune to each other and relate to each other, kind of like in the green room. Like, are you going through this? I'm going through this. You know, did this happen to you at Rooster Tea Feathers or whatever inside baseball? We now do the inside baseball for public consumption. And there's very... Do you know any comedians that you talk to that without judging their stand up that sure. you talk to and you just don't connect with and they're just boring or just you're not interested because I could think of a ton. Yeah, of course. So that kind of takes away what you're saying. Well, we're co-workers too. 
you know what I mean? I think this idea that like we're a family and we're all besties, like I, I'm, I, we're, I, the pandemic, I think, made me realize like, oh, wait, we're co-workers. We have to be able to get along with each other. And I think I, I've worked hard at least to be able to get along with everybody. But it's taken me a long time to go like, oh, no, we're not this like cause family because mm-hmm. I've always been searching for a family. I think that's why I started making TV shows. It's like, you know, uh oh. <laughs> I now I'm censoring me wanting. No, to, do it because I want. Because I want to guess. Are you guys just going to be received bad? I, no, please. Um, TV show. And so uh, you can edit anything annoying I'm doing out. Um, please. It's just going to be eight minutes of me going. Oh. <laughs> um, so I think that I'm always trying to find a family, and I think that when you know come to the comedy store, I'm like, this is my family. And you're do like, you identify as being a stand-up comic? I do. Oof, it's embarrassing. Why uh, should I feel bad about that? Damn, you're so successful, but have so many. Th- I don't. We don't. We're not safe enough with each other yet. Maybe for me to make my observations. Why not? Um, because the thing where I went ooh, and I said I'll remember. Here's what I'm feeling. Um, and also now I'm remembering. My mom says, wants to say hi. My mom loves you so much. Oh my gosh, where is she? Um, sh- Facetime her. So let's call her. Let's see. Because she's. I'm on the phone with my dad yesterday. Mom, tell M- Whitney. Mom says hi, and I say. Um, by the way, this is, a, I love my mom, I'll, whatever she wants, but also like, why, what is that? What, what do you, mm-hmm. I don't like carrying a hello and then I'll have to carry it back. <laughs> sure, what, is, sure. what, what, what are you going to get from this? Sure. Sure. And, um, it, I got something out of it sure. for what that's worth. Um, but I brought up my mom for a reason that I'm sure we'll get to in about 45 minutes. Cause you and I are a distracted bunch, but I do want to say something about my mom after. Oh, cool. This is why we need these. Sick. What's your mom's name? Debbie. Ugh, love a Debbie. Never met a Debbie. I didn't like something this, about this it. Is, this one is insane. <laughs> She's probably watching Castle or something. She, oh, let's. I have one thing about Castle after this. Debbie. Well, what is it with when I when I call moms don't pick up? I don't know. I think that's a coincidence because <laughs> moms always. Did you, pick did up you with call me. my mom? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I was noticing is. My mom is a very confident, secure, when I say loves herself, she wears queen brooches because she's a queen. She always says, I'm a queen, but then she'll say, all women are queens, but she's the queen first. Sure, sure. Um, but I do have this thing with my mom. Uh, we're very playful. Sometimes, and I don't know when it's going to happen, I'll say something or someone will say something and then she'll she's so sensitive. Mm. And it's just like, Wait, what just happened? Yeah. That's that we were joking or whatever. And that's what I was thinking when like, cause I see you as this da 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 da. And then calling people out. And then something happens and I'm like, oh, that's kind of like my mom a little bit. I think people have a very strong idea of who I am based on what they've seen or what they've consumed. Mm-hmm. And then they don't know me really at all. Um, and you know, I don't think anyone is a performer for a living. That's not going to be sensitive or an overly sensitive person in some capacity. I think we're all really sensitive, uh, you know? And so I think for me, people have this idea that I have this super tough exterior. Maybe I've worked really hard to make people think that. And I think definitely in my twenties, when I was starting, I was like in a totally unconscious disassociative You're not in your 20s? state. <laughs> Cute. I was in like a disassociative state and I was doing the roasts and I was, you know, doing stand up where I was, you know, feeling like I had to really um, make myself come off aggressive or protect whatever the psychological reasonings are f- uh, for it. But I, it really does shock people that I have feelings and I don't know what to do about it. I mean, no disrespect while well, you're telling me what your feelings when looking at the fly, but. Oh, that's annoying. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. Do you hear it? Oh. I let out <clears throat> anything with legs. I capture it. Got it. But flies that don't have that, that live a few days, get it yeah, out of here. Yeah, it's bacteria. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the the uh, the idea of like being surprised that you're sensitive isn't it to me. It's more so like you. It's a very specific thing that you bust balls. Sure. Like you make fun. Yeah, I think we all kind of do. I love it. But when girls do it, it's like, oh, she, uh, guys do. I think that's all we kind of all do. Yeah. So unless I, you're like Mike Birbiglia, maybe I don't know. Like, but I think most of us do that. But when somebody busts balls, uh, I uh, I want to go back harder. Yeah, 
Yeah. And I love it. Well, I and also, I want them to go back harder. But I also think that it's like, it's like comics. We're kind of like, um, you know, we're like puppies that want to play. And then when we're playing with non-comics, we hurt their feelings. So when you meet someone else who can go back and forth with you and not get your feelings hurt. But what about you and me? Yes. You're like, oh my God, we can do this. But when I do this or say the thing, like <laughs> I am this, this, by the way, we're going to call this part one. If you come back, great. If not, I understand. Sure, sure, sure. But part one is going to be, because this is other than talking about like, Therapy. Mm-hmm. This is the longest conversation we've ever had, even though we're trying to talk about therapy. I think that's true. I feel like we had a couple conversations when we were on the set of a TV show, kind of. Yeah. But Ma- that, were they fake? Uh, no, but that was all. I, I I met you, not met you, but like kind of. Yeah. Um, the two, the two days after I got out of a relationship and I was just like heartbroken. Right, right. And we were talking about that. We kind of, do you feel like we trauma bonded a little bit or it was in I a did. place where you were like vulnerable? Um, that was when I started going to therapy. I had gone to therapy as a kid a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, but that was when I started going to therapy. I do well in those scenarios. Like I do well, I do well with that. I'm, and I'm not saying you were down, like, but I I, was down. I feel like I'm kind of always down. Like, and when someone else is down, I'm like, oh, I know how to attune to you. you You're always like just in a place where. Um, you know, life has just thrown you a really rough curveball. I kind of really know what to do or what to say and how to say it. Whereas when people aren't, I kind of, I, I'm a little bit lost, uh, you know, because to me, I think I know the terms. It's like, just be gentle with this person. Just share what you know, you know, don't bust balls. Like we were just able to, I think, bond over that mm-hmm. or, or relate to each other mm-hmm. in a way that wasn't just like, what are you working on? What are you doing? So with that, I like to go hard and deep fast. Yeah. H-A-D-F. You know what I mean? I don't do small talk. I do big talk and that. But we don't have bust balls energy yet. Right, right, right. And I see <laughs> you, um, as far as your standup is concerned, I see you doing roasts, sure. right? Like, especially when we when that's what things people were doing. It's like, and that stuff. And it's like, I fucking You'd love- be great on roasts. Maybe we'll get into that. I don't like being mean unless it's a friend. Um, oh, well, that, well, the roast that I started doing, uh, the, the, I don't have to, friends that are successful enough to be roasted. I, I, we'll say, but like, will uh, you produce the roast of Brent Morin? Yes, please. <laughs> I, dude, I could make fun you of that, that Brent- beanie for two years. Oh yeah. Your brother is a, dude. is a figure skater. <laughs> Who gives a fuck? You fucking loser. <laughs> um, but let's produce that. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I think that, I think the roast went sideways when they started mixing comedians with like Pam Anderson and Kate Wall, you know, and you're like, all of a sudden they started feeling mean and we're it's kind of like what happened with podcasts though. Like just trying to get the guests that could bring in an audience instead of the ones that have the chemistry. Totally. And but then let, me say what I, let me say, let me say anything. Well, the thing is, I see you as this. Sure. And I, I also now see you as my mom. Um, Thank you. Uh, I mean that just like, cause age wise, no, no, like the sensitive thing. Oh, sure. Like I want to, f- when I went to your house for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the roast that you screened, mm-hmm. um, I was stoned (laughs) and doing jokes all over the place. You were like, I was like, I love this version of Rick Glassman. You were the life of the party. I I didn't know about that side of you. I went to say goodbye to you and you said some nice things. Okay. And I wasn't feeling insecure about this. But before you said goodbye, I was thinking, she doesn't think I was too much. Hmm. So like uh, that thing, sure, that sensitive sure. thing, because one, the projection. Do you think you were of projecting? It, yeah. One, the projecting and two, the some experiences I've had with you, mm-hmm. like when I and try and do this, yep. it doesn't, it doesn't happen the same way I see you doing it on stage. So I'm like, oh, I don't think we found our fight chemistry Interesting. yet. Interesting. And I think that I have insecurities about maybe not knowing you that well, or maybe people thinking that I'm mean or something. And so I guess just when we started to get to know each other, I'm kind of like, I'm not doing that anymore. Because people think I'm too tough (laughs) or that I'm too rough or something. Oh, I love that stuff. You know what I mean? So, but it's good to know that that's on the table and we can just. (laughs) Yeah, I love that stuff. You and Nikki Glazer. You and Nikki Glazer from the roasts. I now know know Nick. I now know Nikki and I know you a bit, but I didn't really know you guys then. Right. And watching those stuff. And I was just like, holy shit. And I think Nikki's kind of, you know, openly like, uh, that's not for me at the moment. Do you know what I mean? What, or like that? going rough like that, you know? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I I, I feel like sometimes with her, I don't know, maybe because it's with girls, I kind of don't want to come out like that because I feel like it's going to, 
it's not consensual or something. I don't know. What do you maybe mean? Maybe I'm sexist. Yeah, well, maybe. Well, no, I think, and I, and I hope this doesn't, maybe I should ask her if I'm allowed to say this, but I asked her to do one of the roasts and she was like, oh, I just don't want to put myself out there like that oh. right now to be roasted. Yeah, yeah. I you know, understand. Which not I wanting to be roasted. Yeah. Right. Being really good at roasting, mm -hmm. but not wanting to be roasted yep. is, 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 uh, uh, um, curious to me. Sure. Because if you're really good at something, you get the point of it. Sure. Um, and I think if you're really good at it, you want to go surprising angles. You don't just want to go like, you know, slut, whore, small dick, like all that stuff that sort of has been done. Good, and it, I just mean like, it, it, not that you <laughs> couldn't write good jokes about that stuff. It's just been done so much that by the time I got to these roasts, the OnlyFans TV ones, even though it was completely uncensored, we could say anything. We wanted to go kind of surprising, weirder angles. You know, then just like women are old at 40 and like men have small dicks and guys are rapists. Like it was kind of just like that just doesn't feel funny or fresh anymore. So it was kind of like weirder angles, you know, which I, you would be so good at. How come you never asked me to do one? Uh, Push in on her? Now I now now I know that's on the table. I mean, like Big J Okerson just went up and instead of writing jokes, he just read the fact sheet that we sent him mm -hmm. of like the fact sheet about all the talent. And he was just like reading. He was like, this is the most batshit crazy list does of he, facts. But does he, is, whoever's being roasted, is he friends with him? Does he know them? Because I would only want to yeah, do it, it if Bert I know Kreischer. Yeah, it was Burt Kreischer. Yeah, it was Burt Kreischer. So gotcha. he roasted Burt Kreischer. I want to make sure it felt like the Friars Club roasts back in the day where everyone feels like friends. You don't feel like it's just some random. Oh, is this Debbie? Debbie's coming in hot. Why am I nervous? Debbie? Hello? Hi, Debbie. It's Whitney no. Cummings oh, calling. Is Whitney. Is this you? <laughs> yes. Hi. Wh Whitney, you have no idea. <laughs> I, I just love you. I think you're so groovy. Thank you so much. This is this made my day. Really? Because I just got out of the shower and you just made mine. Wow. Oh, okay. D well, we're just calling you. We're on your son's podcast at the moment. No, I can't. Oh, you're not going to roast me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, Debbie, you just got out of the shower. <laughs> Mom, will you, t will you tell Whitney about how when I roasted you and I was mad at you as a kid at, in the shower? Uh oh. You were in the bathtub and you were mad at me. And we had just watched Uncle Buck. And Ricky was really mad at me. And so he said to me, Well, I just want you to know that you're fatter than Uncle, fatter than Uncle Buck. From the bathtub, and he screamed how since. bad I was. <laughs> yeah, really funny. How I'm old sorry, was I? You I'm saw sorry. me naked. How old? What? How old was I when you were still seeing me naked? I, I didn't see you naked. The door was closed. You were in the bathtub. Oh, I just yelled through the bathtub. Mom, I was just thinking about it, and you're fatter than Uncle Buck. <laughs> yes. right. You were just really mean. Even your brother, who who was not the nicest person in the world, said, "Oh my God, that's the meanest thing." Wait, you wait, wait. I, I, I'm feeling defensive now because you're calling me mean. You're saying in that moment, but talk to me as a kid. I'm not a mean kid. No, no, but I mean, you know, it was mean. Who cares about this? Whitney, <laughs> how are you, Bobby? You're cracking me up. I'm good. I'm good. When are you coming to LA next to visit? She just left a few days we ago. Know. We just left. We just had our first grandson. Yeah, congratulations. Our first grandchild. Tell my mom. Re reveal it for the first time to the Tyson oh audience. Oh my goodness. Are yep. you taking on any godmother duties? Because I'm actually pregnant with my first. I, no, are you serious? Yeah, I'm having a boy. Whitney, we just had a little boy. Whitney, you're going to have a baby? Yes, December 12th, Frank Sinatra's birthday. May he rest in peace. Oh, sweetie. Uh, you you got to keep in touch. I know you, that we're doing a podcast and you're going to say whatever you're going to say, but I must know when you have that baby so I could send my favorite books. Oh my gosh, I would love this. Yeah, because I am a book whore <laughs> and I believe in reading you immediately. <laughs> you're a total delight. Mom you're... Yeah, baby. Oh, sorry. I, 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 I cut off two strong women and that's because of the patriarchy and I'm sorry. Go on. <laughs> no, you guys are one for a reason. Wait, wait, how are you feeling, darling? I'm feeling good. I was a little bit tired, a little bit out of it. Um, You know, it's 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 odd. I feel like for some reason, the second I realized I was like pregnant, some mom instincts come over where you yes. just mature really fast. Like, yes, you do. Because all of a sudden you're not as important. Yeah, 100 percent. There's something. Oh, it's such a relief to not have to think about yourself all the time. The, it just well, you, know, you got to think about yourself to watch the baby, but the importance is the baby. And I know that sounds like, you know, like a spiritual thing, but it, there's a connection. There was something that I read. I would love to find it and send it to Ricky to send to Please. about how a baby, the cells of the baby stay within the mother's body right. for at least 18 years. 
That's wild. And that's how come a mother can instinctively know and feel if there's something going on with their child, if their child's not near them, if they're in trouble. Yep. And I thought that just makes so much sense because you're so connected. Did you ever feel that stuff with Rick? Like, did you ever get injured or something? And you like, she knew? Well, I still have it. You know, it's, Ricky and my two sons are old, older than 18 years, but I still feel it. I still get the vibe. Watch I this. still Mom, know. do I have a stomach ache right now? <laughs> we always have a stomach ache, Ricky. So, Mom, when was the last time I took a poop? Well, at your bar mitzvah. I know, I know. I also found out in December that I'm half Jewish. Oh, don't don't try and see Whitney. Fe Whitney feels like things aren't the momentum isn't the same as it used to be. So she's trying to grab onto some identity. I don't feel that, but you think that. I just found that out. No, I don't. <laughs> I just think, why else would you say that you're Jewish? Because my mom died and I because, found out. Wait, you didn't know your mom was Jewish? Love, I didn't know my, I didn't know any of it. the whole world's Jewish. I know. She, they, my, my, da, my dad's mom, Jewish in Texas, changed her name to Virginia. And then my mom's mom also Jewish. Right. I'm sorry, one in Virginia, one in Texas. Mom's mom, but she yeah. didn't grow up Jewish. No, but they sort of, she was I can say this now. She was oddly anti-Semitic. Why could you say this now? <laughs> well, she's dead. Oh, I think so, about now that anti-Semitism is in. No, I just mean like, <laughs> she, like you know, like you know, a guy's you're dating a guy who's gay if he's just like homophobic for no reason, and you're like, oh, why are you so, you know, what, why are you so invested in being homophobic, making me think that you're not, you know? So your mom was anti-Semitic. She would just say stuff. She would just be like, don't be a Jew about it. Like that's so Jewy, and I'd be like, why do you oh, care? Yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And then it all started yeah, making a lot yeah. of sense. And you know what kills me about that? Don't be so dewy about that, like with money and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I would like to, I would like to exp tell the world that I have friends, Jewish, not Jewish, Muslim, Catholic, anything yeah. you got. I got friends that are. And I don't know one person that is, says to themselves, I hope I could pay, pay full price for this. Yeah, also, have you ever been really to expensive. Catholic church? When the basket goes around, they're like putting quarters in it. Like Catholics are way cheaper. I mean, really? I mean, really? Yeah. Like, let, let's see. Oh, good. I hope that it's full price. I hope they don't give me a deal. <laughs> All right. Fun stuff. Really? Mom, is there anything you want to plug? <laughs> There's nothing I want to plug, but Whitney, uh, when Ricky told me you were coming on, I said, I just please tell her I love her. I, anything I see that you're going to be on, I watch. I've loved you before Undateable. And then when I met you in person and saw what a deliciously, fabulously warm woman you were and how lovely you warm. were to Ricky, mm -hmm. I I just re really need you to know, I think you're going to be a fabulous mother. And I just think you're a Aww. fabulous woman. That this is, this is feel, really... That, this. Me feel, that, that got me a little bit. That was nice, this Mom. Is, I'm like, serious. I think you're a... You know, when I see you with like Chelsea and... You women just, uh, just, uh, I don't know, Sarah Silverman, you know, that group of women that are just so empowered. It makes me proud because in, in I'm an empowered woman and I think you guys are just okay. delicious and I'd like you from the start. That this totally makes my day. I hope I'm half the mother you are. Um, I know your son well, a little bit. And what I do know is he's just an absolute dreamboat, massive success. Um, incredible guy. So whatever you well, did, you, please pass those books that, along. <laughs> I'll be thrilled if my know, kid's you know, half as cool as yours. Well, Whitney, it, it's uh, it's the luck of the of the character of the child you raised. The only thing you can do is be the best and loving and supportive behind your kid person you could be. That's all you can do is be there for that child. And then the rest is really their character. But I have a feeling with a mother like you, the kid's going to be really cool. Oh, well, I'm not going to show the kid Uncle Buck. That's for sure. Mom, we're going to put up your dates. I love you so much. And thank <laughs> you for calling you. back. I'll see you oh, next time you're in you. town. Make sure to let me know. Oh, Whitney, seriously, take could, care could of yourself, Bobby. Uh, Mom and I come on your podcast together? Yeah. Oh, well, please. <laughs> yeah. Mom, would you want to do that? This is the I, wisdom I, I America like needs. Go, I would just like to take her for coffee. Oh, well, Mom, unless we monetize it, it ain't happening. <laughs> I love you. I'll call you later. I love you. Okay. Thank love you, you Debbie. You, this means so much Bye -bye. to me. Thank you. Bye-bye, darling. Bye. What a bitch. <laughs> Jesus, is that what it's like to have a mom? Oh my um, God, that's amazing. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I honestly, uh, my, uh, my, I mean, it's like a cliche thing people say. She is my best friend. That's so Without cool. a doubt. So like uh, when she, when she said that you're going to be a great mom and like just thinking about my mom, thinking about other people being moms. Yeah. As opposed to just like she is just the mom. Yep. And just that that gets me a little bit. I'm also nice. so happy for you. Not that it's a now thing, but when you do have a kid, you're going to have her. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the roughest part of um, your mom did this, uh, uh, broke like some seal, um, is like knowing I'm going to have a kid and I have no 
it won't have grandparents, you know, and that's so stupid, but that, that'll, that's a game changer, you know, What's that's stupid? a big deal. No, it's just, it's, it's stupid to like, you know, think that way. It's not helpful, but I mean, it's just cool that you're, oh no, I'm good. I'm wearing a f fleece. I have plenty of stuff to wipe on. Sorry, but no, but I'm just, I'm so happy for you because parenting is so hard and we're meant to have help. You know, we're meant to have, you know, brothers and God parents and grandparents and are you going to get a tissue out of that little house thing it's going to take forever <laughs> there's, there's nothing even in it but i just thought here's the time to use it hey there i want to talk to you about liquid iv this is one of those brands that when they approached me i was super excited because i use them i've been using them actually actually recently talking to esther on one of our episodes of rick and esther her time about the importance of electrolytes and hydration i know what you're thinking rick stop boring us with hydration well i got a news flash for you buddy if you ain't hydrated you ain't gonna be entertained i don't use it every day i know a lot of people use it if they're hungover i often use it if i'm not feeling well to be hydrated if i'm playing basketball or sweating a lot otherwise just for maintenance i do it a couple times a week there's no artificial sweeteners there's zero sugar it contains eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness with three times the electrolytes of leading sports drinks. That's the thing. Esther, you could come on in. Are oh, you... I love Liquid IV. They came on as a Take Your, sh take your Shoes Off sponsor recently. Oh, congratulations. Um, yeah, I was. I use them. This is a commercial, so I don't want, get, don't want to get into it too much, but this is what we were talking about the other day with water where you were yelling at me when I was telling you about what waters I like, and I was talking to you about how sea salt and pink Himalayan salt are the least processed, best versions of salt, which are electrolytes. That's not true. Pink salt has already been proven to not We'll get into this later. No, no. I'm pink Himalayan salt. Sea salt is at the top. Then pink Himalayan. It's the least processed. Salt, electrolytes is just the so clinical term for salt. Salt, okay. So having electrolytes in your water is what hy helps hydrate you. Also, w w you watch Rick and Esther have a time. This is a liquid IV commercial. Real people, real flavor, real hydrating. And Esther, unfortunately for you, now sugar-free. Grab your liquid IV hydration multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code TISO at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you use promo code TISO at liquidiv.com. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Esther, how what? do you feel about therapy? I feel like you really need it. And um, are you, what do you mean by that? Because I love therapy. I know. But it I'm, seems like you're implying something. Well, you are implying something. Let me know what you're implying. Excuse me. Let me know what you're projecting. Okay. I'm a huge advocate for therapy. Love it. Sometimes, and this is similar to therapy, getting a good podiatrist, a dentist. Where do I go? Better so, help. What they do is they help match you up with a licensed therapist. It's nice because you don't have to drive somewhere and you can just do it on your computer. And I feel like whenever I'm in a time of need, the last thing I want to do is like park my car. That's interesting. Is that something maybe to get into in therapy? Fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist. And if you don't like that therapist, you could get matched with a different one at no additional cost. Head on over to betterhelp.com slash Tyso to save 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash Tyso for 10% off your first month. Hi, everyone. This is Steve Lemmy. Hey, this is Kevin Heffron. We would love it if you would tune into True TV for the season premiere of The Pride of Our Lives, mm. Tacoma FD. If you like crying. I do. If you like emotion. You got me. If you like drama. Those are the big three. Tune in to Tacoma FD. Any comedy? Not a laugh. No jokes Not whatsoever. Not one laugh. I know. Well, I'll be watching. <laughs> Amen. You know it, brother. I'll tell you, if, if, if my audience likes anything, it's watching stuff that's not funny. Right. Without even one hint of laugh. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that I was focused on that and then I manifested actually needing it in some capacity? It's called a callback, folks. When you said that you have your sleeve, I believed you. But I also thought, and that, right away I remembered, oh, we could bring the house in. Yeah. <laughs> also, what a metaphor for a home that you're starting. <laughs> yeah. Um, empty. <laughs> Nothing in it. Yeah. Well, you know what that means. Mm -hmm. Got to fill it up. Yeah. Got to fill it up with get, things. You get to start a new chapter. I'm a hoarder as well. Have you always collected things? Things that you love? You got to have them? Yeah. Well, I'm two things. One, I'm a collector. Yeah. And that's a real thing. And what's the difference between collector and hoarder? Because I believe I'm a collector, but some people diagnose well, me as both. hoarding. Yeah. So I, I think that hoarding, hoarding is a, is a real thing. Um, people use the term incorrectly. Uh, analogously, people say, oh, I have such OCD. I have to do this. And it's like, that's not OCD. Yeah. I get it. I get the shorthand. Yep, yep. Um, I don't, I've been in, in your home. Uh, I'm also, I know you have people helping with stuff, I'm sure, but you're not a hoarder. Right. You probably don't like, you probably have a hard time throwing things away. Yep. 
I'm that. And I have I have uh, rooms that it's they're designated to go in. So I've got the horse room, which is only horses. Nothing else is in there but horses. If I put it everywhere, it would look nuts. But this now it's going to do a picture of a room in her house. Just horses. Just real horses. Every- just- <laughs> All over the place. Everything's horses. And then my podcast studio is basically all my, I can't stop buying Labyrinth figurines. Uh, Labyrinth is mm-hmm. a very important movie to me. I, I I, I, mean, I guess it's just the next addiction as we play whack-a-mole moving through our lives of what we're addicted to. My current one is like little tiny. Little, That's collecting. I think so. It because it is valuable. They're handmade. I like to think so. I am into cards and comics. Okay. And I have right next to you merch that I do. This right here. Nope. Look at those cards. Pull those out for a sec. These are awesome. Shout out to Scott Hepper and the the, the, These are the artist. Awesome. You know what the first thing I ever collected was? Garbage Pail Kid cards. Stickers. Do you still have them? No. I was an idiot and Not I put them. Order. I stuck them all over a wall. It's nice to use things though. That was dumb. I know what I was a kid. But how cool are those? What do you think the first thing that you found yourself collect is that I literally went that looks like Mark Maron. Okay, yeah, they're, wow. they're guests. Whoa! All guests that have been Eric on. Eric Griffin, these are sick. Aren't those cool? What do you think mine's going to be doing? If, uh, who would you be? Who do you identify as? Uh, in terms of the superhero universe? It doesn't just have to be superheroes. Okay. As you can see, Eric Griffin is a Mr. Potato Head. Okay. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. But like, yeah. Um, usually superheroes are at least some type What would of... you think? You have, you're have you you're an observational comic. <sighs> yeah. Um. <laughs> I think it's hard for us to, I think it's important to be self-aware, but I think, you know, I also don't know how I come off sometimes. I'm unclear. I'm always kind of shocked at how differently people see me than I see myself. So I'm always open for feedback. Um, Like, do you think I would just be like a giant porcupine? Yeah, I think I could see as a porcupine because Mm -hmm. though she's sharp, the reason she is, it's to protect herself. Yeah, I mean, that's to what we're talking about before. It's like sometimes the roughest people are the ones with the toughest exoskeleton and you don't develop that exoskeleton if you weren't a marshmallow inside. Um, But also some people are just dicks. Pardon me for either interviewing you when you don't want to be or not knowing you well enough. But what's the deal with with your parents? My parents are dead. Uh, my but, mom, yeah. but you, you, you were raised by them? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was raised by them. I was sent away when I was 10 to go live with my aunts in a place called Roanoke, Virginia. I was right. separated from my sister. Um, just alcoholics, um, just raised by addicts. Uh, it took me a long time to realize that in order for alcoholism to be present, alcohol doesn't always have to be present. So there's a litany of other addictions, but I think that my main thing was more neglect than anything. It was more like an absence and then, um, sexual abuse stuff, all the kind of, the, Building regular. blocks for a female. That, I mean, look at me how cute I am. Uh, that was so Annie. That was so Annie. What I just did. <laughs> it was so Annie Letterman. I feel like. Um, but yeah. So I think it was more neglect. I think I had such an absence of socialization that I, you know, was diagnosed with the Asperger's and autism and all the things. And who knows, you know. And now, most recently, Jewish. And now. <laughs> That was so funny how she broke that down. I haven't heard that insight before. Um, But, you know, a lot of times the symptoms of PTSD and and trauma present themselves the same as as autism. So it's kind of hard to sort of tell what's what. But I'm not I always had a very hard time uh, communicating with people one on one for whatever reason. Um, uh, It's completely sidebar, but I want to address because I know this will be comments. By the way, don't move. Uh, The blanket has fallen. Okay. Which is, uh, uh, Whoa. which is, um, the sequel to that movie with what's his name from 300. I thought you meant when, um, Olympus Michael Jackson's fallen. baby almost fell out of that window. Remember when he was holding it off the thing? How could I forget? But no, leave it, leave it. And I want to acknowledge that okay. something I've been trying. I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm always still gonna put the blanket up, but okay. sometimes something will make me a little uncomfortable. Sure. Um, I do that because of outdoor clothes. Sure. Sure. And I have been letting myself feel it a little bit. Um, so Dude. I want to acknowledge that for people who see that. Um, We're more similar than statement. you might think. Did you need to take that blanket off the back of yours? When I make a blanketed statement, sometimes I let people know that that's not necessarily what it's, <laughs> it is. Does this bother you just looking at it because it's like not tidy or it's going to look bad on camera? No, no, no. It bothers, what, uh, what bothers me is outdoor clothes touching my indoor space. I Copy but, that. But it's also fine. Ooh, got it. So it would be more about my shirt here. If I, if you had touching put, it, yeah. If you if you had an indoor shirt, something yeah. that wasn't outside, sure. I wouldn't care. Sure, sure, sure. But also, this is good for me. So yeah. So it's you know Phoebe Robins, uh, Robinson has that book. Don't sit on my bed with your jeans. What is it? Your outside jeans? I don't know it. Okay, it's like something about like when someone just sits on your bed in their jeans. Oh. You're like, are you fucking insane? Yeah. You like you were on the subway. You sat in a cab and you're just gonna like sit on my shit. It indoor is, and outdoor clothes. It's wild. Are you that way? You can't be that way. You 
you have too many guests. I don't have guests like that often. Uh, it's it's a very rare thing. And I try to keep everybody outside. For there's, the most part. there's three levels. There's I outdoor. I have blankets on everything. Um, yeah, because you could wash it easier than the couch. Did you? Could I ask something that's, I don't know how to ask it. I'm just going to ask it. Did you grow up with like, would you say a comfortable amount of money? Uh, I was, we were upper middle class until okay. I turned 12 and we kind of downgraded a middle class. Interesting. But my parents kept that from me. Interesting. I mean, kind of. I mean, <laughs> like I, I, we didn't, I didn't want for anything. Um, right. but like once a year I would get the shoes I wanted. My grandma would get them for me. That's healthy. But was there a concept of like, this is our only couch, you know? No. Okay. No, no, no. The OCD that I have is not a money thing. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, um, my brother um, who is an Olympic figure skater, uh, <laughs> very different than me. Okay. And there was a lot of, uh, things in the house that were, it just, I, I, I delicate. Just, I'm going to give you one example. Yeah. My brother and I shared a bathroom. Yep. My brother would always put the wet towel. He wouldn't hang his towel up. Uh, uh. I had a cat that would pee on wet things. The bathroom would smell like pee. The simple fix is hang up the towel. Sure. But you're a little, you're a young boy. That doesn't happen. Sure. That's just the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot where I'm like, I can't get things the way I want it to be. So sure. in my space, I would keep it a certain way. And there's a big genetic component to this as well. But like, are you highly sensitive with smells, tastes, sounds? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's true. That's that's as a kid traumatic. The idea of feeling like trapped and that's like I had misophonia and noises were my thing, you know, like music playing or TV playing that I couldn't control. And as a result, as, as a growing up in an alcoholic home, not what you necessarily had, but I have this control addiction of like, I just need this to be there. And like why the paper towels don't go there. If they're just there, everything's going to be fine. And I really have to work on it because the rougher things get in life or the harder things get. Like when my mom died, it was just like the Rubik's Cube is supposed to be on that table and it's on this yeah. table. And like now everything is going to just fall apart. That's why when the blanket falls, sure. let, it, let it be. Sure, sure, sure. My, I think that my ability to communicate, which is something I'm proud of, is uh, a lot of it comes from that same thing of needing things to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. And how do I tell somebody without upsetting them and or, I mean, like I have the shorthand with my dad now. My dad, I mean, if if we're, I don't know, maybe. I love what you're uh, doing right now. Oh, I was just seeing if we could hear him chewing from home. Oh, sorry. What did you think I was doing? <laughs> well, it's like sometimes I feel like as comedians, sometimes you kind of say something just to like float something out there. Because I kind of think comedy a lot of the times, at least, you know, when I try to sit down and write, is like saying something that isn't true and then defending it no, and no. that it's funny. But sometimes I'm about to say like a blanket statement and then I'm like, let me make sure this is true before I say it. Because sometimes you just throw shit out just for comedic effect. No, never. I'll never do that. I'm very, I'm very honest. But I like that you're like stopping to think about what you're about to say. It's very often. The truth uh, is rare. I, I was pretending to see if I could hear my dad chewing. That's the only intention of me doing that. Whoa. Um, my dad chews so loud. It's insane. Mouth open? Mm -hmm. um, wonderful man. Wonderful man. Mm hmm that side, his mom, some cousins on that side, they're just chewers. And there's no changing it. Well, you would think, <laughs> right? You can't change a man. <laughs> I so have. I have, <laughs> have you? <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, you had to build your own because you couldn't. <laughs> um, so my, I have this shorthand. My, so my dad chews, oh, and my mom is so protective of, of her people, me, my dad, to not wanting anyone's feelings being hurt. So to navigate, how do I tell dad mm. to close his fucking mouth without my mom being mad at me? Because if you say something, my mom will be like, oh, really, Mr. Crunch Munch, when you chew chips? And I'm like, mom, and I, I'll take a chip and I'll break a chip. You hear that noise? Yeah. That sound is going to happen. Sure. That's not me chewing the chip loud. That's the chip breaking. It's the, and you know what? You can mute this. Shit, well, you got to stop. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had to have a conversation with my dad. It's the chip, not your mouth. Yeah, it's don't drink argument. the chip. Yeah, got it. Break it with your teeth. Look. So I had to have a talk with dad saying, listen, dad. And also, if you say, dad, could you close your mouth? And then he does it and we're good for a day or two. That's fine. Sure. But he'll he'll do it. And then he just muscle memory. He's just the next bite. Sure. Are you familiar with the Ritz cracker? Uh, very. Could you eat one in one bite? Yes. It takes my dad seven. <laughs> It's for real. Counted. He. That's 
That's ridiculous. Did you just fart? No, why? I thought I heard one. Oh. He goes, and, and, and each one, it's, I mean, good for him for enjoying it as much as he does. But, you know, I love going home. It's my favorite thing to do. And we watch movies and we get high and it's the best. My dad doesn't eat until dinner. You get high with your dad. That's yeah. cool. My dad does. And my dad, and then once he eats dinner, he he also, he eats the entire night. He'll finish something and he gets up, he'll go upstairs, he'll take four jelly beans and it'll take, I don't know, three minutes to eat them. And then he'll get up again. And I'm resented. I see my dad get up and I can't. So I, I, is he tall? Is he thin like you? He, he looks exactly like me. Maybe he looks a little younger. Okay. He. What? His hair is insane. Your hair is pretty wild. Thank you. You should see his. Put up a picture. It's what's the ancestry? What's the like Jewish? where? Yeah, I'm. A, but where from? From Eastern European. Okay. Just Ashkenazi Jewish. Okay, nice. Um, do you? But aren't we supposed to be chewing that much? I no. think we're tech. I know. I'm not defending him. I'm not yeah, defending yeah, him. Yeah, no, I'm not that saying. much. Okay. The amount, the, the size of the bites that my dad takes means that he could bite it and then just swallow. Okay. I mean, each. So this feels personal. This is just psychological abuse. At you this know, point. and here's and here's the good Power for me. Move. Here's the good for me. Uh huh. I don't think it has anything to do with me. I don't take it personally. <laughs> I think you might want to. As someone that's in ACA, detached from people's behavior, this feels... ACA. A, adult children of alcoholic. Right. When the whole thing is let go and detach from people's behavior. It's like a 12-step program for how to not take people's Is that behavior. similar to adult children of divorce? Oh, I've never... I don't I don't know that program. Isn't that a thing? Or is that just children of divorce? I thought that was Ooh. a thing that I... You, everyone? I mean, most people. But yeah, I mean, divorce doesn't necessarily mean alcoholism in the home. So yeah, I don't know that program. Um, I told my dad, listen, uh, I can't, I, I can't take it. I can't take that. Right. But also I can only tell you ever so much because what's yeah. the point? And it, and it, and also I have to navigate how is mom feeling today? Uh -huh. So I would love to be able to, and my dad doesn't care. He just doesn't remember. I said, dad, um, mm. I don't want mom to know. Um, but I need to let you know when it's happening. I'm just going to say dad. And when I say, if I ever say dad, just if I have more to say, I'll say, it. otherwise just know that. Yeah. So now we watch, we're watching stuff and I'll go dad. And he goes like this. <laughs> and I have to say it, honestly, I have to say it maybe once a minute or once or two. My mom doesn't catch on. Mm. But now I say dad, she, sometimes she'll goes, what? And then it's a thing you have to navigate and I have to put in a headphone on the side that my dad's And at. when do you just accept and when do you try to change? Like at what point do you go, I just need to remove myself proximity wise or, you know, that's always uh, my ba battle. I've left the room. Yeah. And like know. nothing personal. It's like I was dating a guy. This was when I was first experimenting with, like, okay, instead of trying to change someone or control someone, I'm just going to change my proximity to them when they're doing the thing that is bothersome. So I was dating, this actually worked, uh, was dating this guy who was a smoker and there's something hot about it when you first start. And then you're kind of like, this is just gross. Like this stinks. I can't have a future with you if you're I've smoking. Never done that. I love smoking cigarettes. Like every now and then it's fun. It gives you a little energy, like nicotine, but like waking up and smoking a pack a day, it's just like a full-time job. It's like, and so I was like, I'm not asking you not to smoke because you can't get between someone and their serious addiction like that anyway. It's not going to work. I was like, but when you do smoke, I'm just going to remove myself. That, that's the boundary I can set without trying to change you, right? So then I would have to remove myself Bring this closer. many times a day. And um, and then he just kind of stopped because he got like a consequence. When he started vaping, which what's, was, you know, whatever. The what's the consequence? The consequence was that I removed myself right. and it sort of made things awkward. I was like, all right, I'm going to head out if you yeah. start smoking. You know, so it was like he saw that it was actually affecting the relationship instead of just like telling someone to stop doing something. Just a little passive aggressive. Which is they're kind of like, oh, great. We can just have this little fight every time I smoke, which uh -huh. is like fine. Instead of like, oh, she's, she actually means it, you know? And so for me, I was like, oh, how do I work on mean what you say? Say what you mean, but don't say it mean. I'm not going to judge you because I'm sure I do a lot of annoying things too. But I'm not going to change until you give me a real consequence, which is like your absence, you know? So that's you're not going to I'm not going to change unless I have a consequence. I mean, in that particular scenario, that's what needed to happen. But like it sucks to be like, oh, dad, we just can't have dinner together. That's like feels extreme. But yeah, I go in the other room. Mm -hmm. I go in the other room. And also um, but that's very loving too to just accept like you're this way. Who knows how much time I'm going to have left with you. You know, but I bet he'd kill on YouTube doing like mukbangs and stuff. What is that? Remember those things where you do the sounds? I know ASMR. Yeah, ASMR. Like, I feel like you'd probably kill in the ASMR community. People, I, does the ASMR community, community like chewing? I feel like they like like opening things. But I like the sounds of opening things. I like the like, like, like clucking and stuff like that. But yeah, the is mm -mm. makes me sick. Um, I, I did have, despite 
the 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 stick figure I drew, I did have some <laughs> questions for you okay. that are kind of like rapid fire things that I'm going to interrupt. Okay. If you're if I'm not being answered the exact way I want. Okay. Okay. It's fair. And these are questions that I am going to be asking you as if I just moved to LA and I get to get a coffee <laughs> off a podcast with Whitney Cummings. <laughs> Here are the questions okay. I would ask. I was just excited about my question. Okay. Also, I'm gonna go wash my hands. Okay. Let me hear you. Um, I had no idea that the the podcast was the filming of a movie. Like, I thought it was just a producer and you. Do you think I know how to work any of this equipment? Yeah. You think I, what? Are, what is this? Yeah, I don't. I just. I'm I, not Rick Glassman. What do you yeah, think this is? I just. This know, is a real production. I know, but why? Why? You no, know, you don't need all these people, and I don't want to take any of their jobs away because they all they're all working very hard. They're all on their phone and everything. <laughs> Dude, it's amazing what coffee does, man. I yeah. Don't, I don't drink, but like. And when I do drink, I sometimes feel like, whoa, that that feels cool. But I never want to do I, like I'm it's that it doesn't turn me on. But you're sensitive to it enough to where you feel a difference. I feel a difference. And I feel, oh, I get this. It's not for me, but I get it. This shit, I'm fucking, I feel unbelievable. That's now. amazing. I mean, I feel that like. Not, is that not good? No, it's delicious. I'm just, I'm just kind of a little worried about just yep. the um, also, house who, of cards I've built over here. Um, pun intended. <laughs> who, who is it father? A uh, guy from North Carolina, computer programmer, hillbilly. Amazing. We'll yeah. put up his Instagram handle here. I know he's not on Instagram. Um, that, was, that, on, was that one of the was that one of the requirements? You've met him. He's a school shooter. I don't know. He's just this very super kind guy. Not online at all. How'd you find him? Sweetheart came to a show. Came to a show and was like, "Question. Wait, wait. Yeah. Was this planned? The baby? Yeah, having a baby. We didn't plan it per se, but I basically went off birth control and we're like, if it happens, it happens. But I was convinced I was barren because that's what Reddit told me. Is uh, this a person that's still in your life? Yeah, he just dropped me off. Right. That's what I that, that, yeah, because. Yeah. Are we so? Are we denoting his relationship with you? A denote we, is, are, is this is your boyfriend? Yeah, right. Because yeah. you, when I said who's the father, you said a guy from North Carolina. Yeah, yeah. Which is a, <laughs> it sounds like a sperm like if, donor. If you, yeah, if you, if, yeah. That's what I thought you were saying. <laughs> well, I don't know what else to call. It. Well, like, it's where weird. did you get that? Oh, it's this girl who lives in New Jersey. <laughs> Oh, my girlfriend. You know what? You're right. That does sound weird and shady. I don't know what to call him. I'm not going to say baby daddy. That seems so basic. He loves Star Wars. And the other day I was like, what do I call you? Boyfriend? Well, seems maybe insulting. watch The Mandalorian for him. If he's he literally quit said, I was like, what should I call you? And he was like, Lord Vader. I was oh, like, he's a dork. I was like, you're my baby's father. What do I call you? He's like, Lord Vader. I was like, oh, my God, I have to get an abortion now. And you met him at a show. Mm -hmm. He sort of like came up to me and like was just. And into you. Yeah. And just started, you know, I realized that I had never dated a guy who was a fan, I think, of comedy kind of at all. Uh, I had always like kept those things separate. I had kept, you know, what I did for a living super separate because I thought for the same reasons that we were talking about earlier, like I'm just too much or I'm a mass. People had told me I was emasculating and I was like, OK, let me just like not let the guys that I date see me do comedy or listen to do me do people podcasts. that you dated said you were emasculating people just told me I was Did not anybody who you date any man you were with say that I mean not in so many words but it would turn into like this power struggle that I didn't even realize there was a power struggle do you hear that I think you just have a couple ideas okay hmm you don't hear that beep um I was just making a joke that like uh -oh. when you hear a bell like you have an idea <laughs> Ding. and so I uh I basically you know we separated these people, uh, these two parts of my life, you know, didn't hear me on podcasts. I was like worried if I talked about them or talked about other relationships that they would get weird about it. I don't know. Uh, and then you get in this tricky situation where someone's like, you know, I love you. And you're like, well, you don't know me. <laughs> so you can't even, you know, accept that. And what it are feels, you saying? Well, he like, said he loves you. I just mean that no, in me? past relationships, like if you've never seen me do stand up and you never see me with my friends or on podcasts and stuff, if you don't know that side of me, like you don't they, really know wait, me. But you dated people who didn't want to see you do stand up? I think I just like sort of separated it and they didn't have any problem with that. You know? Yeah. I think it wouldn't have worked had they seen that part of my life. That's tough. Kind of weird. Yeah. Kind of weird. Although most of us don't sit and watch people do their jobs every day. Most people are married for 20 years and they're not like at their person's work knowing exactly what happens, you know, but I think that I just, I also think that for me, I would have felt constrained if someone I was dating came to see me do stand up. Or I, I don't like it. I would have felt self-conscious. Like, I don't like it either, to be fair. Um, people, you know, uh, especially guys, uh, a lot of times, um, you'd see guys like bring girls to a show. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was always thinking like, 
if this girl wants to come to the show yeah and she already likes you why risk it and let her see you do stand up? Interesting. <laughs> like, Interesting. I, I, like I just, I, if the girl liked me, mm-hmm. I feel like I got on base. Why I would I double. push it? Yeah. Why well, would you know I push what? Let it? me go again and see if I can get a home run. <laughs> yeah. I guess I also just, I guess it's weird because I don't think the art craft or whatever it is of stand up is particularly masculine, but doing it on stage is, you know? So it's like, you know, people are always like, you know, stand up comedy is a male dominated profession. It is, but it's like mostly stereotypically male I'm sorry, stereotypically female things you're doing. You're talking, you're complaining, you're trying to get attention, you're, you know, talking about your problems and being vulnerable. That's what it is. But being on stage- You're just describing Jewish again. The way, the way I do it is, I think, somewhat aggressive. And I was sort of just led to believe that if I show any kind of like aggressive masculine qualities that a guy would not be interested. Here are my questions uh, in no particular order. Um, what, was, what was the moment where you're here- And something happens where you're like, looking back, not in the moment, Mm -hmm. looking back, like that was, that was, that got me in the door. What was that? Um, I think it was probably the Comedy Central roasts. Uh, Which one in particular? Joan Rivers. Um, I think I saw it. I don't remember it. I would love to watch that. Oh, gosh. I've started doing this new thing where I put God and Gush into one thing. Gush. Yeah. I don't know why. Uh, yes, that was my guess. That was it. I was a How writer. How did you get it? I mean, I was also a writer on the roast before then. So maybe that's technically, that, that's when I felt, when I was getting paid to write jokes, that's all I ever wanted. You Who know? asked you to do the roast for Joan Rivers? I was writing on the roast before that. Um, and they had said like, you'll do the next one. And they- Who's that? Just Comedy Central. Comedy Central. Yeah. Like I had done one of Steve Tisch. Uh, no, I'm sorry. With Steve Tisch of this, of Quentin Tarantino and the Friars Club. Steve Tisch, Harvey Weinstein, Pete Berg, like- Brett Ratner. It was right. like a Friars Club roast and we filmed it. So then how after, are those guys doing? You know what? <laughs> I mean, I'm shocked. You roast them now? I am shocked <laughs> that no, now I'll defend them. I'll always be on the opposite side of everything. But now it's That's like. That's actually a very funny concept. <laughs> That's a very funny I'm concept. I'm just so contrarian that I just have to be. <laughs> well, the uh, yeah, uh, 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 people that like are getting roasted outside of the Comedy Central thing. Be like, well, hold on a second here. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's like, what, before this all happened, I was like, Harvey Weinstein's a rapist. And now I'm like, look, hurt people hurt people. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Everyone that was molest- molests has been molested. Like, you know, how long are we going to, like, you know, and it's also shocking to me that nobody has done, like, let's make some super movie with all the canceled predators that are incredible at making movies. You cannot argue that, t- that movie ha- movies I- haven't gotten worse. I had an idea uh, for a show about a, an entertainer who just can't get his break and it doesn't have success. And maybe some of the people around him does. And he realizes, I don't know what to do. Maybe if I could get canceled <laughs> and he just gets canceled, but also nobody cares about him. <laughs> so the things that he does doesn't. So he has to keep one upping. Yep. He keeps one upping. And then he finally does. And then people realize he's doing social commentary on it and good for him. And he's doing all these things by doing all the wrong stuff. There's something interesting about someone who's like not a very good leader or like can't be taken seriously. And he's like, oh, people are getting canceled for being toxic. And so he goes into his work and I'm like, let me get fired and canceled by yelling at people. It's like, go do that, you piece of shit. And everyone actually starts listening to him. Yeah, it, it works. <laughs> and then he becomes really successful. Yeah, it's all about intention. If you're trying to get canceled then yeah um but i I don't want to go too below the line okay joan rivers you're writing and they go whitney we would like for you to be on camera for this you're already doing stand-up well they i written on the flavor flav roast i wrote on i i wrote a joke actually i wrote like 16 pages they uh, submitted it to the flavor flav roast they had said we don't hire anyone else certainly not girls like we've got our five people i wrote like 16 pages or everyone i thought would be on the dais and there was one joke they really wanted so they brought me on for a week what was the joke the joke was about flavor flav and it was flav you look like what magic johnson should look like right now they wanted to use that joke Mm -hmm. and then so they hired me for a week and then i had to prove myself and stay and then i got called back again to do the roast of bob saget and then I was supposed to be on the one of Larry David. I'm sorry, not Larry David. Um, Larry the Cable Guy. And then I got cut. I mean, it was like. How'd you get the gig writing them? How long were you doing stand up? I was doing stand up maybe like four or five years. And then I had been a writer on Last Call with Carson Daly. I did mm-hmm. stand up on that. And then I just kept submitting packets. I just wanted to do it so badly. Like when I watched. Jokes, 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 jokes. Because it's like math. Like roast jokes are math jokes. At the Absolutely. end of the day, you it's like it's like a crossword puzzle. You write down everybody's name. You write down a fact about yeah. each person and then words. And then you start putting the words together. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, I love the math of it. One of my favorite jokes ever, Greg Giraldo saying about um, Ice-T. Ice-T, you're so old. You used your first residual check to buy your freedom. 
It's like a history joke. Mm -hmm. It's like there's I just love that shit. And I love the surgical nature of it. Yeah, like, you just take facts and recontextualize them completely. And it's like the idea is closer. the idea is you take them one way and then go this way. And, you know, the more fat you have on it, the I'm so sorry. less it's facing away. And there's going to be echo. OK, how about that? Is that better? I'm also like weirdly out of breath. <laughs> Being pregnant, you're just like out of breath Do all the time. Do we need to take a sec? No, 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 I'm good. Um, I mean, you tell me. And uh, and so I just, I love the the surgical nature of it. It's not emotional. It's not opinions. It, like someone can't tell you you're wrong. Like it either gets a laugh or it doesn't. And it just feels more fair than a lot I've of talked it. about this with Mark Norman a bit because like- He's great at that. There are people that hear a joke that is dark or- or um, hear a joke that is dark mm -hmm. uh, because the variable happened to have been that, but it's the same exact joke as the positive light version of it. Sure. Um, uh, and it's something that is newer to me to wreck it. Horrible example. Uh, and, and such a cliche where people are talking about something about sex on stage and it goes, uh, and then someone will be like, yeah, so anyway, I don't talk to my grandma much anymore. <laughs> and then it's like, sure. oh, he's been fucking his grandma. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. people hear that as a fuck grandma joke as sure. opposed to just a left turn. Well, I don't talk to my ex anymore. I don't talk sure. to my to my brother. Whatever the thing might be, people hear the an incest joke as opposed to a left turn. But the word joke, that is very clearly a joke. And if anyone thinks it's serious, they're too dumb to come see comedy. No. I like that. I like that because it takes it takes it takes all pressure and responsibility off us. Right. But no. It's not that they're too dumb to see comedy. It's that they don't have the same palate and they think what people are saying that I know. I don't think they think that it's true what he's saying. No, but I do know. And I know this from my personal experience, even though these people are wrong, they're not dumb. But in their life, this is true. It's not in mine. Well, you know, there's truth in jest. Every joke has some part of truth to it. Nope. That's not that's not true either. But, but people think that and it's not because they're stupid. It's uh -huh. because that's their religion. And but if you're going to go see a Mark Norman show and you don't know that's what you're going to get, I don't know fair. what you're doing. But people who will hear a joke ancillarily. Is that well, that's different. That's what we're doing as comedians now is when we're, first of all, writing jokes out on Twitter that aren't being delivered by us. We're giving our jokes verbally to non-comics to deliver themselves at their desk at work, which I think worked for a while. Um, but now it just it seems to have expired that being charming or cute. Let's get off Twitter. And not only that, or start charging for it. Why aren't we charging for our jokes? Why are we just like giving out free jokes to people that are like, this who's is punching buy, down this? Buy Twitter jokes? No one has to. You know what I mean? Does I'm just saying, why are you giving out jokes for free for someone else to deliver? You're making them do half your job and they're not doing it well. And then also when your joke gets retweeted, it might get retweeted into someone's feed who's not following you, mm -hmm. who didn't sign up for comedy. You know what I mean? So I think that it's like this time where we're listening to people's opinions who aren't comedy fans and who aren't signing up for comedy, who are like weighing in. So my point, if someone goes to a comedy club and they're like, uh, about a joke, it's like, what did you think was going to happen? When I walk into Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom or whatever, I'm going to see a couple of clothes that I'm not going to want to buy. I'm yeah, not like, but, I'm but not you like, throw a fit. I no. <laughs> You don't. I will be like, I'm not going to be like, I'm out of here. Like, oh, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not going to wear that. You know, so it's like if someone's going to a comedy show and they expect every joke to be something that's specifically catered to their taste, I think you're dumb. All right. Here's where I'm going to be a little rude. Sure. I agree with what you're saying. I also don't even want to talk about that stuff anymore. Yeah. So, by the way, neither do I. I just I, I just think there's this thing where com we're always like on the defensive about like people groaning at us. I think that's always happened. I think com communities have always been polarizing. I don't experience that. Yeah. I know that's a thing. I yeah. know that's a thing. I never experienced that. Mm -hmm. At least I'm not aware of it. I think we've given the audience so much power to give us feedback that we're just like, it's all we talk about is the whether the audience that's likes us or That's why I don't even want to talk about it because the audience doesn't like me. A, a niche amount do and I love you guys for it and I appreciate it and yeah, the yeah. rest don't and that is what oh, it is. Oh, talking about like inside comedy stuff. I love talking about comedy math. Yeah. I don't want to talk about comedy culture because. And there's also no way to quantify it. We're like, people think this. It's like what people, who people, like my brain does really well with specifics. When things start getting vague, I start like not knowing. Same. And I want to get into the specifics of stuff I'm genuinely interested and curious about. Back into Whitney started writing jokes and now she has a horse room. So. <laughs> yeah. So. I've become a joke. Uh, I love. Um, I mean, No. <laughs> I'm You're just joke, successful. I was joking, yeah. So you, you, somebody who could become so successful from just filling in variables like that is so cool. Uh -huh. Like you found, you found. Oh, here is a tiny 
and I don't mean this in a derogatory sense. I mean it in comedy. Here's a Short, tiny lane s- skill set. Yeah. Like here's a here's a a party trick. Sure. At first, here's a party trick. I yeah. could, oh, I see these bricks and I know how to put them together. I can make a Rubik's cube come. Yeah, that. Yeah. But then you have to find a way to sell yourself, mm-hmm. and then do whatever the thing that women have to do. Boring. Yeah. Yeah. But then also the thing that like climb, climb, climb and give an opportunities and, and then execute them. Um, and you do what I, I don't know if I say I do or what I want to do, but definitely want to do, which is you get to make stuff and then people will be like, I'll give this a shot. And then you get to make more stuff. Sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but how did that happen? And you went on TV mm-hmm. and then you were funny and you're pretty and I'm sorry if that's a, a no, demeaning thing you. to say, but I mean, that that's a it's thing. Um, and then people are like, oh, we like this girl. Mm-hmm. And then at a certain point, what? Like They start to hate you. <laughs> why? Once, once you made I, I think X dollars? Oversaturation, maybe. You just said that. So there may be something to it. Not, what did I say? Not saying that you think that necessarily. What but was the oversaturation thing? That I started making X dollars. Like it could have been that. I don't know. I think that uh, that a tide turns on people when they're no longer the underdog. Um, perhaps I think there was. Like- I want to lead you with this. So whatever you're saying, also keep in with what happened, not just like how society sees sure, it. Sure, sure, like sure. What did you do? Sure. And and how did that happen? Sure. And I think that that doing do, doing the roasts in retrospect. Sorry, I went off Prozac when I got pregnant, and I feel like my my brain just like skips sometimes. <laughs> like have trouble just saying you, but- basic sentences. Um, but I uh uh. The roast in hindsight was the, I think, biggest way for me to get as much as possible right away or as much exposure as possible because it's something that's very brave. It's very brazen. A lot of people talk about it. I did punked before that, which was kind of a thing at the time, but like no one the really- The first season of punked? It was, when the, it was brought I want to say it was the third. I mean, the first iteration with Austin Kutcher. Yes, sir. The first iteration. And it was like a, after he had canceled it, you know, but no one knew me by name then. I think in the comedy community doing the roast at that time was such a big deal. That- Sometimes it happens. I don't know when. Oh, that one went out. Um, And so I think that it hurt me a little bit too, but you know, I would have done it a million times uh, during the roast because I do think it, the thing that has haunted me the most is people not thinking I'm warm or not thinking that I'm like Uh vulnerable or something and people thinking that I'm really tough. So how does that hurt you? I think just as a result, the kind of like professionally acting parts I get. Yeah. Maybe a little bit professionally. Um, you know, it's a lot of like, you're uh, the rough ex-girlfriend, you're the rough, this, you're sort of the combat of this person. It made it so I wasn't able to, um, get parts that were a little more vulnerable or did you want that? Did you want to be acting? Um, you know, I just did like a drama, um, my first like drama that, that I felt safe enough to do that I didn't think would be like humiliating or, you know, not come together the way that I just thought Just as it an would. actress or did you write it? Just as an actress. And, uh, because, you know, it's like, if you don't have control, it could be very corny, very fast mm-hmm. and very embarrassing. And, you know, and so for me, uh, I do mostly get offered parts that are like the cunty ex girlfriend yeah. or the sex crazed ex-wife or the bitchy agent or, you know, which I'll do them. Like I did that in the Foo Fighters movie and then in the Machine Gun Kelly movie, like I'll, I'll do that. I'm good at it. You know, I have that in me, but I think it's been very hard to like get over that idea, which is kind of part of the reason I just was like, let me just bring the roast back. Like people kind of see me this way. I'm going to do it in uh-huh. a, in a warmer version. Um, because like, I agree. I think that when you're ribbing people to me, that can be like actually so much warmer than being like, Hey, how are you? And that like mm-hmm. fake shit, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but so yeah, so did the roast. I started writing sitcoms. I just started writing all day. I was writing all day when Dane Cook had a uh, pilot at UPN that doesn't even exist anymore. None of those words even exist anymore. It was called Cooked. Jay Kogan was writing it. They were holding auditions and I wrote a spec for it. Like I wrote a spec for a pilot that didn't even get on the air. That's how psychotic I was. I when, saw you- when did you, when did you look <laughs> What did you read to uh, to understand structures? Well, and I just saw you have the book on your shelf, Shave, Save the Cat. Yeah. Not Shave the Cat, but that's that's your own. That's, <laughs> a, diff- it. that's a different book. Um, and I would put out index cards. I would read pilots. Mm-hmm. I watched the Cheers pilot over and over again. And I put- I um, love the Cheers and Frasier pilots. People uh, always reference two those. Two of the most perfect uh, pieces of- um, you know, fiction ever made. The casting was also incredible in so many ways. It was magical. The Mad About You pilot is also excellent. A lot of great pilots out there. And I would just basically like, and then it would, Help me out I'm here. so sorry. When it was pilot season, I just keep thinking I'm being too loud. And then I'm breathing too much because I'm inhaling and exhaling. So that's why I keep moving and it won't happen again. I think you are Jewish. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm, you know, so, I'm it's seeing not it. just half. I'm seeing it. I'm sorry, just I'm breathing a little heavy. I don't know. I, just, I, just, I just need a tissue. And it's, so, and it's, the coffee is a little too much. I know. Oh, it's, sorry, it's, yeah, like, so far, I've cried. I can't breathe. And you think I'm farting. So there's definitely like a um, Jewish theme happening. But I uh, I lost my train of thought. Um pilots oh yeah i was a psycho i mean i was like i had vision boards up i mean i had you know i had written pilots out and index cards breaking it down i would get all of the pilots from agencies i wouldn't get auditions for them read them all i would read them psychotically and and, and did you look at them and like did you try and break down yes act breaks and storylines yep uh, and you saw it in in a formulaic way, mm-hmm. correct? Yes. Similar to IC joke structure. And then the way the times that I would get called in for an audition, I would always add other jokes, like a button on the end mm. of the scene, or I would sort of improvise a little. Which were they? I knew I was never going to get the job. I knew it was never going to happen at the time. It was like Ida Field and Busy Phillips and Lizzie Kaplan and all these people were going to get the jobs. I knew I wasn't, and I knew going in, you you're going in to number one practice auditioning, meet the people in the room and just like be funny and make mm. it add jokes. And then they started calling me in to do like punch up. And then they knew you as a somebody who could do that because of both roasts and auditions. Or just, yeah, I was able to come in and like nail the audition, but we knew I was never going to get it. And they said, hey, listen, we, we didn't give you the role, but we think you're really funny. Could you help punch up with the script? For that, free. Yeah, not pay. Yeah. Is that really what it was? <laughs> kind of. Yeah, that started happening. Right. And then casting directors started having me come in to like read with other actors. And, you know, I was in, you know, taking acting classes at like Leslie Kahn, which is very sitcom, yeah. you know, but I just was like. I'm doing this. Like I was a total psycho about it. It was not an accident. Like no one saw me at the improv and went like you. Wait, I still want to get to you reading the scripts. You're reading scripts and you're and you're reading the pilots and you're mm-hmm. um when you read a pilot now, uh somebody else's pilot, do mm-hmm. you do you go like, is it easy for you to see, oh, I like this or I don't like this? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh how much of that is based off of structure and how much of that is based off of jokes? And how much of that is based off of characters? I usually know everything I need to know by like the first couple lines of stage direction. Like that usually tells me what- But that's you judging the writer, not the script. Same thing. I mean, to me, it's like the way that you write your stage direction, it's either going to be like, oh, you don't think stage direction matters, number one, or number- Show me good stage direction. Make the, 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 the beginning of this pilot is from when you walked into my place while I'm making the coffee, while you're going pee, sure. while we're checking this. Let me hear it. Because I think good stage direction, you're already directing the show, yes. right? Your, your, your job is to make sure that I understand. If someone says like, uh, you know, man, you know, early 30s, parentheses- how would you describe yourself? Like, what would you think would be well, an 22. interesting description? Yeah, to, um, <laughs> 22. P- please. Flawless hairline. Um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll do this with you. In fact, sure. let's do let's this go. on a separate thing. But first, I want you just to do it. I, okay. I'm, I'm learning from you. I'm not playing okay. with you right now. So this is going to be the, the someone's cutting in right now. Interior, townhouse. Coming in right now. Coming not now. Coming in as you walked in. Okay. So interior, townhouse, Rick. Bleep the location. Oh, sorry. We're not even there, by the way. I did. I did that on purpose. Um, uh, Rick, 22. What's our what's our description going to be? Confidently neurotic. Okay. uh, I guess because of this podcast host. However, confidently neurotic is kind of confusing to me. Uh, It feels a little bit like a charming description for the sake of being a charming description. Confident, uh, confident, but neurotic or neurotic yet confident in the things he's good at. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, cause then I'm going to go, I'll know based on the dialogue, what he actually is. Kind of like adding, like having that, I, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker had this thing where they're talking about every scene needs to have a, but, or therefore, have you seen that? No. I loved it. Was it in the documentary? Uh, Seven Days to Air. I don't think okay, so. Okay, okay, okay. No, it wasn't. I love them. What they talk about it's like if if you have a scene and then this happens, yeah. it's pointless. Right. You need to have something, but this happens, or have something. Sure. Therefore, exactly. This right. We're right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so the action's actually leading. But to you're a saying result. that even in a descriptive sense, like sure. he's this. However, to find that contradiction, just something, something that the dialogue is not going to prove to me. So don't try to sell me on what he is because your dialogue is going to have to do that. Because then I start going, oh, the well, worst, you- the worst is this. When it's like, Lindsay, 25, pretty, but doesn't know it. Right. What girl doesn't know she's but like, what are you talking? What am I supposed no. to do with this information? That I connect. What with. am I supposed yeah. to do? How do I so what, act what, pretty what, but doesn't know what it? What do we? Uh, well, you're doing fantastic. What do we put in the character description 
what, what so how would you define the purpose of this i like it when someone goes you know um you know uh loves batman but only the christian bale right. one right so we're I just, go, we're just I getting know to who know this, this guy is that's great i know the, exactly who we're, this guy is we're not trying to sell you who this person is we're giving an example of something and letting you fill it in be specific because yeah. then i go he's confident he loves batman but only the one right. with christian bale but that's also kind of neurotic the type of guy that has a, a a grogu nightlight but doesn't watch star wars love it sleeps with the tv on but only if it's martin right i'm like i okay but you could put that for me by the way <laughs> me too but or should i say but only if it's 10 minutes of bet commercials <laughs> totally so then i go Okay, this writer's already specific. This writer's not trying to sell Love me it. some bullshit with adjectives that mean absolutely nothing. I always thought the character descriptions, I always, I, I, I never get it. I always think they're stupid. You hate actors. If you're going to put, you know, pretty but doesn't know it. You hate actors. You great. don't understand women. I'm out. I love the specificity of likes Batman, but only the Michael Keaton or whatever version. Exactly. That's a great. Michael Keaton, even more interesting. That's almost like a roast joke. Yeah. It's not a mean true. thing, but that's, it's one of the variables. Yes. Like, okay, he only does this stuff. Yes. And I like this writer is going to take a risk, isn't afraid love to be it. specific. He, know, he knows who his character is. Love it. Let's keep going. Okay. So I'm like, I'm, I'm going to keep reading because this person lifted a finger when it came to stage direction. Also an interesting observation. Um, that you're that you're pointing out is not just a good script but engaging the reader you're not okay so if you're wasting my time when i'm reading this you're gonna waste the viewer's time in your self-indulgent self-indulg bullshit you know so to me every single word matters cut to podcasting <laughs> cut to <laughs> Cut to the drivel. If, if only, if only we could take <laughs> your podcast and make it a character description. No, but these are people that sign up to be bored. It's their right. king. <laughs> right. If you have a bad script, make it Patreon only. Yeah, yeah. Understood. <laughs> and so then, um, yeah. So keep going. So then I like okay. Enter Rick's apartment. Is he a hoarder or collector? You decide. No, no, do it. You do this. And I'm it doesn't doing have to be accurate. It. I'm doing it. I like that. Oh, you're saying is I'm, your hoarder I'm saying, collector, you yeah, decide. You decide. Great. Hoarder or collector, you decide. Great. I like that already. Love it. Because I'm going, okay. Hey, you're good. Okay. <laughs> you're real good. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. You're committed to entertaining me. You're, this is open to interpretation. I'm already interested. I now want to see this apartment. Mm -hmm. I, you know what I mean? I'm on the edge of my seat. But no need to explain it anymore. Right. They and they walk up the stairs. Who's they? We haven't established. Oh, sorry, Rick. I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, trailing behind Rick with easily four backpacks is filled with juice. <laughs> Wendy, twenty one. <laughs> um, pregnant but doesn't know it. <laughs> By the way, is, is she pregnant? Is she I, pregnant from a guy from North Carolina or her boyfriend? We don't know. I didn't know for ten weeks either, which is so sad. I didn't know for ten weeks. For two months, I was pregnant. Had no idea. We're in we're in craft so, mode. So point is, um, so why don't you take a why don't you take a stab? Go here. You want to take a stab at bring, the knee? Bring this to you. Oh, sorry. Um, really when, loud yet won't hold a microphone yeah. to her mouth. Um, uh, Wendy, um. What about Wendy tells everyone she's 21? Mm hmm. Um, okay, here's my question for you. Are we setting up when we set up the character? Does it have to be anything to do with what the scene is going to be? Or are we just trying to be specific to paint a picture so the reader is entertained? It depends. You might write the scene and then go back and tweak the stage direction based on what you need the reader right. to know at the time. I kind of like, and this is half about me, it might be true, who knows, but I like the idea of like, Wendy, you know, whatever, 40, bless her heart, because that's more interesting anyway, um, for this description, the harder she tries to keep it together, the more of a mess she is. You know, it's like, I'm coming, I have four bags, I'm trying to get up the stairs, I'm trying to have my shit, and then shit just falls apart. You know, it's almost like she tries too hard at life and hasn't surrendered that life's gonna happen, this blanket might just fall. Wendy, 21, um, I guess that would be action though. Uh, That's okay. Do it and then we can we can um, change uh, the tense if we need to. Uh, asks if she could put on makeup before the cameras are on, but spends the entire time talking about it. Great. But I think we show that. 
I think we show it. First right. thing she says, can I put on some makeup? Or walks in and says, is this on camera? Right. Whatever it is. I, or 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 the the I think the version of it that works that tells you everything you need to know about her is her going is opening with the dialogue. I love your podcast. I just well, watched a bunch I'm... of episodes. Cool. And then she goes, is this going to be filmed? Yeah, that's what I was. I was thinking that one, too. Um, so you already have that joke. Um, and that's you like that as dialogue as opposed to. I think so. Right. Why I not? Because so. if it's funny and put it in dialogue. And or I think it's interesting to go. Wendy, 21, very successful, yet oddly nervous about this low stakes thing. Low stakes. I mean, it's high stakes, but it's also. I'm joking. I like the idea that she that I mean, I'm nervous coming into something Great. where I'm kind of just talking to my friend on a podcast. Great. And okay. you're like, we have a big guest today. And I'm like, what? OK, so she doesn't understand her status. Like she's sort of dysmorphic about how successful right. she is, um, which is pretty and doesn't know it. But with money. I think she thing, knows though? she's successful. She just either feels like a phony or, you know, thinks it'll go away at any time. Or That's reminding me if we were introducing Megan Trainer. OK, <laughs> Megan Trainer is like, oh, my gosh, is it, I can't believe I'm doing that. Like, da, da, da. it's like you're a. <laughs> You're a, but that's one why of the she's so goddamn. Stars in the world. That's why. That's why she's so good. I think we're at the point where nice guys are going to start finishing first, and you can't get away with being charming a little bit sometimes. Like Ellen was able to pull it off an hour a day. Are, but are you? Are you giving us the exclusive that Ellen is actually not a nice person? I, I'm unclear. I, I don't know. I kind of think making your employees sit in a box the entire show to jump out and scare the guest is cool. <laughs> uh, Remember how wild that was? I didn't know about that, but I have had people on the balcony. Waiting till we open it up. Oh, oh, hey. Holy right shit. Oh, that's why. Wow. Hurry, <laughs> wow. Legitimately <laughs> surprised. <laughs> Legitimately surprised. Oh, Miss George. <laughs> you need me. Holy shit. You're killing it even harder. I honestly thought that was a recording, man. Yeah, me too. I, got, I, I didn't know whether to stand up and applaud or fucking... George, I haven't seen you for so long. Wow. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Holy shit, George. Adam, how you doing, man? Great, man. No, but remember, Ellen would have an employee sit in a crouch down in a side table and then halfway through the interview would jump out and scare the guest. Hey, have you seen Under Siege? No. Really? Is that what it's about? <laughs> no, but there's a scene where there's a, a woman in a cake who has to pop out. Ah. Uh, Listen, man, that's show business. That's, I feel like, the, you're fair. You're right. That's show business. You're right. I'm wrong. Um, But I like that. I mean, it depends. What's the show about? What, like, what do you, what do we need to know about this character in order for this? Let's say if it's about them, they end up dating. So if they end up dating by the end of the pilot, they look at each other and like, it was you the whole time. Then we want to make them sort of as, um opposites as okay. possible as much conflict as possible so when you are when when you are to write this scene first even though you know what happened in the scene because we lived it okay you're wanting to know um where it's gonna go mm -hmm. and is that something that you will try and have before you start yeah if you know where i'll i'll know the finale of the first season before i try to write the first season of the pilot you kind of you got to know where you're going in order to know how to get there that's what works for me right. um and then you know but sometimes you want to just sit to, sometimes you're wrong sometimes you're like wait we should follow this character this person is so much more interesting than i thought that they would be and things will change or whatever but if you're like we're building towards a breakup we're building towards them getting married then you go they cannot get along at all in the pilot in order for there to be enough tension or conflict for do, it to be interesting. Do you feel that writing episodic television um, doesn't allow for as much creativity with the arc of where it goes? In general, it, it depends. Yeah. I mean, it used to be 24 episodes, it, you know, so it's like I got lucky enough to when we were making the NBC show and then when we made Two Broke Girls. And Is the first one you had Whitney? Yeah. Yeah. And you knew when you wrote the pilot how the season first season was going to end. Yeah. And is that something and that, it changed everything in between kind of course. changed, yeah. you know, but, um, you wrote this pilot and then did you have a development deal yet? No, I wrote it with Crystal Lee in mind. We were friends and I wrote it for him, like about us as if we were dating, and like what, who, who sets up the pitches? Um, I guess at the time it might've been, uh, my manager or an agency. I had an hour special come out after I did the, uh, a couple roasts. I had a deal to do a special. I did an hour special and then I was able to get a bunch of general meetings and I treated those general meetings as if they were pitches for TV shows. I'm just remembering sidebar, but I'm just remembering I used to do background work. That was. Oh, sick. Uh, 
and I did audience. I was in the audience of some thing that you hosted. Um, uh, Tony Rock Project. Was it a whole bunch of comedians? It was, uh, it was multiple comedians and you came out and talked to us. Was it a was it in Santa Monica at the Broad Theater? I don't know. Uh, was it Byron Allen Comedy TV? It was on a stand up stage and you introduced a comic who would do five to ten minutes. And then I would come back out. Yes. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. What year was that? 2005, maybe. I six? moved out here 2008. OK, so then 2008. 2008. <laughs> Well, I, did I just punked. remembered that. I guess that makes sense. I did punk in 2005, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that makes sense. I thought it was earlier for some reason. So when you were doing that, you were still, you were doing film, film stuff. Uh, I'm not yet. I mean, I had been in a movie. Like I remember when I was writing the roast, I had gotten cast in a movie. When was the roast? Uh, the, the you first... just asked me a time question. I, I get this shit so wrong. I want to say maybe 2008. When was the roast of Joan Rivers? Yeah, it's 2023. July 2009. Okay. So I was 2008. I was writing on the Flavor Flav or- Almost 14 years ago. Wild. What a trip. Um, yeah. So then I did an hour special and then it was like, okay, a girl did an hour special. I got to get- Were you some... happy with the special? The first one- um, What was it called? Uh, Money Shot. What is it with female comedians? Oh, the, I saw the that. The first specials always have to be so sexual in name or always naked. Is that naked. the first special or was that the time? Was that, was that the like 2010? I had done an album before that. Uh, which was just recorded. I think I did it at La Jolla Comedy Store. That was just audio only. Couldn't even tell you where that even is. But yeah, that was my first special. I was like wearing bright pink lipstick. I was like yelling into the microphone. Uh -huh. I had no concept of like, you know, what to do with my body. I feel like I was just like manic. But I, your first special is always going to be kind of just like you're learning how to do a special in front of everyone. You know, I mean, that's what I think is like I look back and I'm like, I cannot believe I learned so many lessons publicly. You know, like it's just like so embarrassing. And I think that when people are like, I want to make it sooner. I'm like Gary Shandling told me something before he died. I didn't know him that well. He just was in passing for whatever reason. He was like this guardian angel moment where he I just introduced somebody last night to Larry Sanders show, by the way. But anyway, go on. <laughs> I mean, the comeback and Larry Sanders show are probably my two, the two greatest comedies the ever comeback made. is unbelievable. What Gary Shandling said was, you can never make it too late. Don't remember the context, but that's what is said. It, it is a, it's, it's a horror move. It's like, it's almost not a comedy. The older you get as an actress, it becomes just like a horror movie. But I mean, I think truly Larry Sanders and the comeback are the greatest comedies ever uh, made. I think they're fantastic. I don't need to shoehorn my opinion in there. But I mean, for me, I, I, that might not be true to other people, but um, but they are masterpieces and to make you cringe, to break your heart and then also make you both laugh. seasons of the comeback, <sighs> which are so far apart. Was it like 10 years apart? Flawless. I think about 10 years apart. And when you go back and watch it, you find new things. I'm like, I'll rewatch that. I might go rewatch that. Ugh, it's just it's like Labyrinth. You go back through and you see new things you hadn't you even like noticed Labyrinth? before. Love um, so much. So so uh, when you sell Whitney. Yeah, I want to go to that. When you sell Whitney. Um, do you talk publicly about money? Um, uh, why not? Cause, uh, um, they, do they, do they just buy the, they buy the script first or they buy the pilot or is it a pickup? They buy the pilot. How so much they, did they pay for a pilot? 25,000 maybe. So you get 25,000. Is that a lot of money for you then? Uh, it is a tremendous amount of money for me then. Uh, but you pay agents, you pay managers and then you pay California. So I probably made agents, managers eight, and lawyer. Yeah. So and you lawyer. Pay 25% yep. before tax. So mm -hmm. you make 50% of and that. And I was probably $80,000 in debt. So you made 12,000 on that. Probably. Before write-offs. <laughs> uh, uh, which you write a lot off. Uh, so, okay. So you made $12,000. This is your first thing. Mm -hmm. And then when and then if you get a pickup, but when you they get bought the pilot, they, they were making it. Yeah, but then you're now paying a publicist, and now you're paying a we'll, stylist. We'll get, into the, like, we'll get into the complaints that nobody wants to hear about. No, in this I thing. know, but it is funny to me that when people first start getting successful, everyone thinks immediately they have like a hundred million dollars, and you're usually more broke when your first thing it is, is on. Wild. It is wild. I, 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 I had a TV show last year got canceled. I'm now this year. I'm going into a second season of another show. Yeah, awesome lottery. I'm renting a place. Yep. And uh, I, I don't know how you buy a house. And you're known, like so. There's also the added thing of like you might like need security at some point, you know. So it's like I know a lot of people that. That's why we believed Burbank. Get on. You could keep that one. <laughs> get in. on TV shows, and they're kind of like, well, I'm still fifty thousand dollars in debt. This is how much I'm actually making at the end of the day, and I can't afford I, security. I can't afford. I do think this is all relevant and fun stuff to talk about. I just want to make sure that we stay with this, though. Please. Because uh, we haven't gotten to the point where you need security yet. Right. We're still, you just got $12,000 to make a pilot, and now this is a very big deal. 
right? Right. Um, do you think it's going to go to series? Or and then you- Two Broke Girls, I did the same the same year. So those were both simultaneously. So the pilot for Two Broke Girls filmed in the same year. Mm-hmm. And you weren't running that, were you? No, Michael Patrick King ran it. But y- you ran Whitney. Yeah, no, Betsy Thomas ran Whitney, but I created it and they were like, you're going to need someone to run this. Did you agree? Uh, yeah, the first year you kind of do. And then after that, I was kind of like, this feels like a lot of people, a lot of cooks in the kitchen on yeah. things that should be way more streamlined. And I think that, you know, I was just so young and I was also doing a talk How show. How old are you? Uh, at the time I was 27. Wow. And both wow. my parents had strokes that year. Um, my mom had a stroke two months into the, the writer's room. Um, and then they had me doing so much press. I think that was part of the reason I think people were so annoyed by me is I had like, there were billboards of me and Chris like everywhere. And it was like, they took my tweets and were like, half of all marriages end in sweatpants, which was yeah. not the tweet. They had to like sanitize them for these like, you know, posters. And because it was a multicam, the art department kind of treated it like it was Veronica's closet or something, marketed it like a hokey multicam. You if know? you were to give advice to young people, women, people mm-hmm. who are in a place of new success and all the press and all the pressure that they have to do on stuff, sure. would you advise them to say, you don't have to do all that? Well, I just don't think that exists anymore. I don't think that the four talk shows exists anymore. I don't, I, now you have to, you do 50 podcasts and like, you know, you do late night, you have to go eat chicken wings with hot sauce on YouTube. There's just, I mean, you can do- I would love do, to do that show. Yeah, me too. I love that show. You can do, I don't think we're famous enough to eat- Have you not done hot ones? Hot sauce, no. Um, Gina they Rodriguez. Had, they had Viola Davis on there eating chicken wings the other day. I was like, this is awkward. And racist. <laughs> Hey, Viola, you want to come out and eat some wings? So now if you do Kimmel, you do Fallon, you do, it's like, do people notice? I don't know what really matters anymore, but it used to be like you did yes, Letterman. But they all still do it. I would do Howard Stern, David Letterman, Tonight Show, Ellen. But what if you don't want to? Rachel Ray. Gina, I want to, real quick, my show is, Gina Rodriguez is the, the star of it. Love her. She's fantastic. She's and great. she was talking to me about how when she did Jane the Virgin and she was all very new and how much she had to do and they kept pulling her and doing this and this and this. And now she has new boundaries where like, I'm not going to do that. I don't do that. And I'm thinking like, that's, that's so great. That's a bummer that you didn't feel safe to do that. Then I had no ability to say no to any of that. You know, you had no ability to, or you didn't know you could. Um, I mean, it was, they put a hundred million dollars into the ad campaign. You know, it was like, they put so much into it. The show tested very highly. And this is after the pilot was tested and it, the show filming. was ordered. Yeah, so I was doing the press while in the writer's room simultaneously. Okay, so, so. you film the pilot, they go, we fucking love it. Yep. We're all in. Yep. And now you're doing all this press while you're writing episode two on out. This is yep. your first time doing this. Yep. Two Broke Girls is going on. Are you in that writer's room? I've tried to be as much as I could. Were you? It was hard. It was hard. That wasn't a show that you put too much writing into then? Um, We would meet. Uh, Yeah, no, I still read the scripts and sent notes and stuff like that, but I wasn't able to be in the room on a and regular Whitney basis. And Whitney was, you're in the room. I had to be, yeah, I mean, I was the star of the show, so I had to be there every day, all day. And then my mom was sick and my, you know, it was like, it's just something weird happens. Like when, you know, I think, I think that I feel kind of lucky in a weird way that something horrible happened in my personal life during it because I wasn't able to process everything else that was happening, like all the press and all the negativity. And, you know, it was kind of like the first time Twitter was really starting to like drag people. It was like happened to Lana Del Rey. And then it happened to me in a way that was like, what's the dragging? She's not funny or no. Remember she went on Saturday night live and uh, it was her first live performance. And she just got like destroyed Lana Del Rey. But what happened with you? Uh, Same thing. I mean, I just had, I was just getting, I was like the butt of every joke on, comedy Twitter, like people I like look, looked up to, like thought I was friends with. Um, what kind of things were they saying? Um, that you're just not like funny? making fun of the ad campaign, making fun of the show, of saying the show. the show wasn't funny, right. you know, just like it's a laugh track, which is, you know, there were was shows it? that, no, there were shows on uh, at the time that were a lot, actual laugh tracks that yeah. wouldn't get shit for that, you know, but. It wasn't a laugh track. I just put too many jokes in. Looking back, you just go, oh, if every other line is a joke, it starts to feel monotonous, you know, but I'm a comic and we would add jokes and everything. Chris would say that wasn't even intended to be a laugh would get a laugh. You but know, do you, do you still believe that? Cause I mean, 30 rock is one of my favorite comedies ever. And there's it's all it is is jokes. Yeah. But there's not a, you don't hear an audience. Gotcha. It's single camera, multi-cam. You're going to be hearing the audience. What do you think so about it starts the, to get the, kind of like format. monotonous about multi-cam? Also, even though we kind of said it, I have learned that some people are confused with what multicam means. Multicam is, it's a stage play. There's an audience there. There's three walls Mm -hmm. and they're doing a play except for it's televised. Single cam is new girl Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. There's nobody there. There's no world where people are watching and laughing. And there's a big difference in terms of the way, you know, they, they, they have no respect for acting basically on multicams for the most part. Jim's 
Jim Parsons on Big Bang Theory got some attention for it, but um, there's only so much you can do in terms of close-ups because all the cameras are preset. So um, Cosby Show, Friends, um, Cheers, these are all multicams, uh, if you hear an audience, basically. But in single cameras, you can, you know, have really, yeah. you know, uh, clear, cogent micro expressions, and you can use music to make things feel more emotional, and you can, you know, change camera angles, and people can have behavior. You're not as worried about continuity, but everybody kind of has to be planted. Yeah. Uh, on a multicam, as you the, know, the rehearsal was uh, I always felt was more about choreography than than acting. Yeah, because you both have to be in one camera and you kind yeah. of are all just like projecting to get to the last row and you're not able to sort of you're, you can like make tea, but that's kind of about it. What is your take on the format? Because, I mean, the two pilots that you referenced were both multicams. Mm -hmm. And I did the Roseanne uh, reboot, which was also, I think, maybe. I don't know, maybe kind of last time and maybe there was like a new multicam that that kind of did did well. But that was a obviously a reboot of one that was really yeah. successful before. Um, Do you I, still want to create shows? And if so, I mean, like multicam or are you done with the format? I think I'm done with multicam. Yeah. I mean, unless some, you know, I had some ideas of intermixing single cam and multicam, like with the person's nightmares being multicams and stuff, because I kind of have nightmares mm -hmm. in multicam <laughs> of just like my worst nightmares happening with like a laugh track following me around wherever I go. And, uh, you know, but I think that it's, it's, you know, because the orders are pretty much six now, six to eight, it's doing a multicam doesn't make a lot of sense. Multicams cams are great for 26 episode orders, syndication, you know, that's kind of what it was made for. But because syndication is pretty much over, you just have to, you know, get to maybe 118 episodes and then you syndicate around the world. Now the second the show is made, it's streamed internationally yep. right away, which a lot of people that have complaints that like comedies suck now. It's like, well, yeah, because you have to appeal to China, India, everyone. And they the suck at comedy. first episode. Not even so much they suck. I don't know, but their references are not going to be as you know. Thirty Rock had time to breathe. It had mm -hmm. time to get known here. I'm sure half the people in China don't understand most of the jokes in Thirty Rock, but it's already become a success here. So then they'll switch it over. They'll change it. They'll dub it. They'll cut the jokes out that don't work. But like now, it's just something has to be so watered down and bland because it has to appeal to everyone instantly. What makes you want to uh, make shows still? It's interesting because I think when I have something like you know uh, that you know, you want to say as an artist, like you're very good at communicating. I'm not very good at communicating. There's times I'm like, this is a thing I want to say or convey or that I think should be expressed. And you're like, okay, is this a joke? Is this a stand-up special? Is this, you know, better served as a movie? Is this better when served is some, as a series? When is something, what is the conversation where you're like, do I talk about this on stage or do I write a, uh, uh, uh a narrative about this. What is the conversation you have with yourself? For number one is like, is this something that's ephemeral? Is this something well, that's going ephemeral means. Like if this is something that is like, if you're writing about trans athletes, that's probably a now thing. That's probably a stand up joke. That's probably something you should or tweet, you know, at best. Why? Because you think that trans athletes have a shelf life? I just mean, it's probably not going to be as zeitgeisty in the future as it is now. Like if you're like, this is what everyone is talking Interesting. about. So if something feels current, I want to talk about that on stage. Mm -hmm. If it's something that I feel will be talked about in three years when this thing comes out. Yeah. Yeah. And is this something on a daily basis? Because, you know, it's like when you're making a TV show, you're living and breathing something all day, every day. And you're like, is this something I kind of just want to talk about in dark, you know, gritty clubs at night when everyone, anyone's, everyone's already had like some tequila, you know, and I can change it if I want to. Or do I want to commit to this for five years and think about this for five years? So Roseanne, you know, it was like, yes, I very much want to think about class war for five years. That's interesting to me. You know, the show, the sitcom, you know, being in a, a female who was commitment phobic in a relationship with a man that wanted to get married like that was my experience at the time. So I was like, yeah, this is something I'm down to like live in. Two broke girls, like, you know, growing up with no money, waitressing, like, I'm like, yeah, this is something I, I want to live and breathe, but it has to be something you're really ready to live and breathe. You're about to have a son uh, with a guy from uh, North Carolina. Um, and then that's, that's going to be a big part of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, what, What's the creative? I mean, the, I have to, the only reason you want to do stuff now, and I, I pardon me for speaking for you. Please. You have enough money. Mm. No, people think Publicists. that people think that. Yeah, dude. I mean, I've had to basically finance my family by both my parents had strokes without health insurance. Like, you know, there's a lot. So are you still driven by money? Yeah, totally. I think you I think you have to be a little bit, too. You know, I think it's important to go like, is this going to be successful? And I think that. You know, maybe that's like a mercenary approach, but you're gonna like the, everyone successful on, meaning monetarily is everyone going to make money on this because right. it's not just me making it. You know, there's, you know, another 200 people. I mean, now crews are getting kind of smaller, but it's like everyone should be able to get, you know, money off of this. Should, I don't have that mindset mm -hmm. um, because I haven't gotten to the point where that's necessary. I only want to do things that I either want to 
be talking about or that make me laugh. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, part of me complains I don't adi- audition enough. Uh, I mean, I'm on something now, but also like, Do you I get asked to audition and you just are like, this isn't. There, uh, the, yesterday, I got two emails. One was for an audition for a cool movie that I feel like this is not a role that I want to play. And the other is is somebody is an offer for a movie for something where it's something I've already played and I don't want to again. I'm like that too. But if it paid you 50 grand. 50 grand is a lot of money. I'm still renting and I want to save up and buy a house. I'm not going to do it. I own and I don't know. I'm sure there's pros and cons depending on what what my brain also is. goes. Well, half the movies that com- most people don't see anything anymore. So I'm kind of like, if I play the same role in four or five things, chances are people might see one. So my brain is also like, but, does that? But which is a which is a fair thing for the pros and if it does well, great. If not, nobody saw it. I get that. But I only do, and I think this is a good thing. But I also think that it gets in the way sometimes. Mm-hmm. I only do what I want to do. Yeah, all the time. I'll only eat where I want to eat. I'll only hang out when I want to hang out. I don't want to go to this thing. This is a wedding, but it's out of state. I'm not too interested in this. I'll yeah. send a gift. Yeah. I only do what I want to do. And I'm now no, I'm now feeling yesterday was the first time where I'm actually like, I need to reevaluate. Mm. Even though I like this about myself, is it servicing me? Where do you, yes, I don't want to do this movie, but then you meet these people. Yep. Um, but also, I don't want to. Yeah. And I think most people have to do things they don't want to do. I mean, I'm, pro- I'm probably the opposite in that way of you. I think we have a lot in common, but I probably do things I don't want to do to a fault. Like, I'm all, I always am making myself uncomfortable. I'm like, I really don't want to do this, but this casting director will see it and this person will see it and this will be good because then I'll be able. And then I'm constantly thinking that's going to buy me the ability to only do what I want to do later. But that day just hasn't come. Where I'm like, I'm going to do a bunch of things I don't want to do now. So I'm going to have the freedom to only do the things I want to do. Okay. But, I, but you already have that freedom now. So why change it? Because everyone's doing things they don't want to do so they can get to where you are mentally. Uh, Rick Glassman, um, uh, 22, uh, only does what he wants to do, but fears it gets in the way of allowing him to do some of the things he wants to do. Is Only does things he wants to do... Um, okay, let me give you more examples. Mm-hmm. Um, I thankfully all of them legal or something because you're because that sounds like a selfish person or that sounds like a hedonist or that sounds like a right. like a Dan Bilzerian or some like get, or, oh, or right. Harvey Weinstein, but you're not. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You ha- you police yourself and you have self control and the things you want to do are all wholesome. So it's like it, it doesn't sound selfish or like ugh, like repellent forget the writing aspect i'm not talking as a as a entertainer now um, okay i hate traveling hate, uh-huh. hate 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 i think most people do yeah um i'll only speak for myself i hate it to the point to where i don't do it yep um i love stand up mm-hmm. um i don't love only doing 15 20 minutes yeah uh, i do 15 20 minutes all the time i don't go on the road do you um, resonate at all with the, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of comics say we don't get paid to do stand up, we get paid to travel. Uh, I've heard uh, Dennis Rodman say we don't get paid to play basketball, we get paid to do everything else in between. He's one of my main inspirations in everything I do in life. I'm <laughs> yeah. dead serious. Dennis Rodman? Uh, 100%. Well, that's directly so analogous my, to that. So I dyed my hair. Because um, of Rodman? Yep. In, during the pandemic. Um, so though I get that, um, I am now finally, because I... I could sell some tickets, I think. For sure you could. I'm now finally going to do it because I could travel the way I, I'm I'm going to travel first class. Yep. I'm going to stay in a nice place. I might make no money, but I'm not going to be losing money. That's the only way I'll do it. So now I, I stayed home. I built this podcast. I put a lot. Now I have help, but I put so much time and work into it. I couldn't have done it if I was traveling all the time. Amazing. I did something else, but all of my friends and peers have m- numerous specials doing, uh, you know, I have huge stand-up followings and I don't. And the reason I don't, um, to give myself credit saying that I am good enough for people to enjoy Mm -hmm. is because I didn't want to. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Are you jealous of anyone? You don't have to tell me who. No, no. uh, I think that is the, that to me is success. To To be in this business, I look around and I go, I'm not jealous of anyone. I must be doing something right. I don't wish I had that person. I don't wish I was doing what they were doing. And that's, that's you know, only five, four or five years ago. Can I say that? And that's a weird measure of success, but it's cool. It's really cool that you can say that. Um, I, for, uh, I don't believe, 
and I'm not saying what I do is great. I think it is, but let's let's not let's assume that other people see what I do and they don't think it's great. I believe that nobody could do the thing that I do. People love what you do. Thank you. I love the thing that I do. Um, and when other people are doing things, that's not what I do. I mean, this like I said, there was this movie that um, that it's a great movie. Yeah. That's I don't do that thing. They, the thing they want me to play. That's that's I don't want it. That's not my thing. Yeah. And you also haven't been forced on people by. You know, I think that's something that I I didn't realize was happening with me. But like, is that why you said overexposure? A company like forced me on people. You know what I mean? No, and I, don't I didn't. Know what you mean. I just mean like when you're, you know, it's like you know when you see a comic who you're like, oh, I guess this is who the town picked this year to push uh, on everyone. Yeah, people say that about Kevin Hart. And then comics are like, we don't know that person that well. Like we, you know, you guys just picked him because you saw this or her. And that's the, a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, but I, I think comics are kind of like, where did you come from? You know, whereas- That when, was the roast when you were on him. I remember that was the stuff that people would do, say to you all the time. Oh, that I was and like- who the fuck is this person? Yeah. Like who did she blow or something? Sure, sure. I, I, I mean, the, the people that- Who did that, you blow? The, no comics, I've never dated a comic. Not one time, but also blowing someone doesn't get you jobs. <laughs> it's that's the total opposite uh -huh. from what I gather. Um, but I, it's also hard to believe, I guess, that I worked really hard. And I think at a time it's like all the people that were like, who'd you blow to get that? I'm like, maybe stop smoking weed all day and just write some jokes. Do you think you were picked? I think I've picked my, I think I, I, I walked into rooms and was like, I, I needed this. To, I was like, I, this is happening. But like, didn't I, other people walk into rooms with that same mindset? I don't know. And that weren't picked? I haven't walked into rooms with other people. I walked in with 16 pages of jokes. Right. And was like, you have no choice but to hire me. And what do they look like? They're like computer? Yeah. They were written out. Like I had- One, two, three, four, before five? Before I had, no one asked me to be on the roast. I gave them no choice. I was like, send this packet to my manager. Please send this in. So you knew of a roast that was coming up and you wrote jokes for it. And I say, was on the set of hey, a movie in I'm England. I'm going to use these if you want. I was like, can I send a packet in? They're like, they'll never read this. And then it got to the head writer. Everyone needs jokes. I know. Right. I, I had known enough about writer's rooms because I wrote on Last Call with Carson Daly. I was like, if someone's like, was sending in packets, I'd always be like, oh, who's this person? Who's this comic? And someone was like, yeah, we need this joke. And I just like took that big risk. I took the biggest risk. I spent three weeks writing 16 pages of roast jokes about Lisa Lampanelli, Greg Giraldo, Jeff Ross, all these Greg people. Greg Giraldo, man. The best. I feel like people don't know Greg Giraldo. People know Mitch Hedberg, but they don't know Greg That's Giraldo. That's so interesting. That's heartbreaking. He said something once that changed my life. And uh, it came up actually earlier when you asked me if I identify as a stand-up comedian. And I kind of was like, why should I feel ashamed? Um, I thought of him because, you know, he was the guy that his, the joke about him was always, you know, you have no TV shows, you know, he's a great stand up. It was like, let's shoot this before, you know, Geraldo's here, Mike could cancel. Cause he would kind of get a pilot every yeah. now and then it wouldn't go. And he was just like a great club comic that everybody respected, like a tell, you know? And Man, he was so funny. The best. And he would, uh, walk down the red carpet. And one time someone was, someone cheeky was like interviewing him and was just like, so what's it like to be the guy whose TV shows never go. And th th that's the joke about you. And he just dead serious. He went, when did it become so embarrassing to just be a comedian for a living? Like it was like dead serious. And I heard him say that and I was like, okay, that's the thing. Like, that's the thing. As long as you can do that, like, you know, cause it's like so few people can do it. And it's so odd how people are like, oh my God, you're a comedian. Yeah, I could never do that. And on the other hand, you're like, why do I have to feel like shit about this? Everybody is impressed, but yet I feel like shit. I'm I never, yeah. When I asked you that, I didn't even think of it as a judgment. I, I don't, no, I think I still in my head go like, oh, why? Because I'm desperate and needy and, you know. So you see comedians as desperate and needy? No, I don't. I just wonder if like, is that why, you, how much attention do you need? I still just have that inner monologue thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I connect with that. When someone's like, you're a stand-up. I'm like, I'm a writer and I do the other things and da, da, da. And then when someone's like, you're a writer, I'm like, I'm a stand-up. It just, I go back and uh -huh. forth because I don't want to just maybe be one thing. I identify as funny. Great. Um, but you're I a skilled podcaster. It's a skill. Yeah, uh, um, but like when uh, I I now know that when people think of they say the word comedian, they mean stand up comedian. I never thought of it that way. Um, oh, interesting. Because like there are so many f funny. Uh, I mean, Tina Fey is a comedian, right? Yeah, but she doesn't do stand up. But like people think of the word comedian. I just think of f funny and if whether it's stand up or yeah. sketch or anything yeah. like are you a funny person because then yeah. i mean i guess professionally but also interpersonally you have value to i mean 
pardon me for being judgmental to me at least. Yeah. Like, oh, am, are we going to laugh? Yeah. Um, I think that stand up comedian, I think, you know, look, I, I hope I'm not overstepping and saying that like there's insecurity that drives a lot of performers, but I think there's something about saying, you know, stand up comedian that makes people feel like they have an exterior that protects them or that it's like, I'm brave. Like I'm braver than you. And that's what comedians think or that's what audiences think. I think sometimes stand up comedians take umbrage at not being called stand up comedian. Cause like, no, I'm braver. Like I'm braver. There's like something about it that gives us a sense of safety or superiority or sort of something, you know, what? I'm not confused by saying, if by someone saying just I called me, a, it was like, you're a comedian. It wasn't clear. I was a stand up. I'd be like, well, I do stand up. Like I would need to clarify because I'm like, it's so hard and scary that I feel the need to get credit for it. I don't know. I'm just exploring mm. my own need to use that word. I I did stand up because I wanted the audience, not because I wanted the art, the, uh, the craft of it. Mm -hmm. Like if I could be funny on set somewhere or at a your party, if money weren't an issue, mm -hmm. I mean, on stage is just, ooh, I get to do my bits. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't feel very romantic about the idea. People talk just the, the high that they get and just being able to make a room full of people laugh. Like that feels no different to me than yep. being with, with friends. I don't even get a high. I just get relief that it's, it's only relief. Like it's not, it's not a, uh, it, it's like, um, it, it just gives me like an equilibrium, you know, because you, do you get to do that off stage? No, I think I, I think to be able to go in front of a group of people and be like, this is crazy, right? This is, I'm not crazy, right? And people laugh and uh, you go, okay. Uh, so you feel like you're, you're, you're getting, you're, you're being accepted when you're on stage. Corroborating my reality just to make sure I'm not losing it. I just feel like, and maybe I don't, I just love, it feels like I have friends. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm playing. You feel seen, you feel... I don't, it's not seen. Mm -hmm. I don't feel seen. I mean, I do now, thankfully, was a byproduct of just, I guess, writing a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. But like, I just, I, I don't know. I, I get hyper and I want to, what do I do with this? Yeah. What do I do with it? But I want to not lose the advice that I'm asking for with that. Like, going on stage at the Hollywood Improv, mm -hmm. which is my favorite, Oh, nice. Um, versus traveling somewhere right. to go and make money doing it. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Yeah. I just want to play with, play with people. I just want to play. But imagine the people that you have, that have fallen in love with you and they are in Pensacola and they're in Cincinnati and imagine them showing up for you in your merch. In my merch. Or with your baseball cards, oh, right. or, you know what I mean? Whatever it is, imagine a, a thousand people in a room that have listened to every episode of your podcast. Mm -hmm. Imagine what that will feel like. You know, I'm not saying it'll make you feel seen. I don't know what emotional lack you need to fill, hole you need to fill. But I think for me, I love that feeling of going like, I brought all you people. Yeah. It, you guys don't even know each other. And like, I get to see all, cause we're doing this to connect with people. We are doing it to connect with each other, but like we have to take responsibility for the fact that like people fuck with you and people go, oh my God, he thinks the way I think. And oh my God, he is sensitive to the fact that I don't like, you know, and like, oh my God, he pulled this reference and like you're lighting. Do you get off the same way for that thing of people watching, coming to you live show versus watching one of your TV shows? Is it the same? Showing up live is, is, is such a big deal. It's so, watching a TV show, it's like, pfft. Anyone can do it from your couch. You know, they say that people that say they their favorite TV show is Big Bang Theory, they've seen how many episodes? I don't know the Average saying. of three. So even someone who's like, you're of my favorite show ever, or tweets, I love this show, thank you so much. But also 200 people worked on that with me as well. Yeah. And chances are I had to make a lot of compromises, you know, whatever. But like, there is this, you know, the fact that in a time where no one ever has to leave their house for someone to go on, put on pants. I mean, what does it take for you to go see a show? Yeah. Do you go see live stuff? Imagine how I do, much. I do when I'm in New York. I how, love going to New York Think shows. about in wherever you, but that's New York. You're not, you, you'll, like musicals. you'll tour there. Oh, awesome. You'll tour there. But like the idea of like Tori Amos is coming. People, half of you probably don't even know who Tori Amos is. I was just. The she cookie was, girl. 
<laughs> That's famous Amos. Who are you talking about? That Tori Amos yeah. is like a, she's like the antithesis of Fiona Apple. There's Fiona Apple bitches, and then there's it's apples and cookies, right? And then there's uh, Tori Amos, and like she's coming to the Greek, and I'm like fighting for tickets online. Yeah. I'm going. I have my outfit. It's like you're someone Star Wars. Like you're someone's. But what is? <laughs> it's fucking when do you, cool. When do you know? Yeah, I, I believe that. Um, I, I have only a little bit experienced that so far. I'm just now starting to do it because I'm because I want to have a special. I want to put a special. That's nice. what's driving me. Um, but I'm trying to get a better, a better intuition or recalibrate for that matter of when I don't want to do something so I don't, which makes me a happy person. Uh-huh. Versus when I don't want to do something, but to check in with the reason I don't want to do it and what might this benefit me. You said you'll do everything you don't want to do and you're waiting for that to, I mean. Not touring. I, you know, I really like touring. I really like, you know, writing I, things. You know, I think it's just. I, I love writing. I love doing stand up. I, 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 I hate touring so much. I've thought about, is this the right business for have me? Have you ever thought about, but you don't like traveling? Do you like visiting other places? Because I've also, now when I go to another city, I'll fly in a day before I went to Calgary and then I stopped in Banff before, which is like a f- screensaver. You're in a screensaver. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. And I'm like, now when I tour, I'm also going to do something for my soul. I'm going to see a part of the city. I'm going to start to see the world. Like I'm going to go in early to Cincinnati and I'm going to see the their local sh- v- uh, rendition there is some, there of is Rent to the see, night before. There is something to staying. When I travel places, I'd make sure like, like when I go home, I don't go home for a week. I go home for six weeks. Oh, like that's if I'm going to go somewhere. Because I have to bring everything. Yeah, I'm that I, person too. So that is that what you struggle with traveling? Because you got to have your shit, huh? I always check luggage, even if it's for one night. Yeah, I travel with four suitcases. Great. I see nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's just it keeps me from doing it a lot. You can you have a tour manager. Yeah. You can also send stuff ahead of yeah, time. Yeah, that's the thing. I think if that's, there's a level of success. What else are managers success. doing? Managers, they can send your stuff ahead of time. There's a comic I know who has their bedding sent to the hotel. It's who? there when they get there. I'll tell you after. <laughs> But it's a great idea. It might be me soon. I, I bring my pillow. I bring my. I always stuff. bring. What do you? I bring three pillows. I got my leg pillow, my neck pillow, uh-huh. my sleep crown. You gotta have all of it. I got my noise canceling headphones. I have all my toiletries. I gotta have a bathtub. I mean, you have a rider that it's like here's all the things I need to not lose my mind. Yeah, you know, you know what? I think if there's something. If I had help, then I would maybe be okay with it. Maybe I should. But how do you get that without first, you know, earning it? I'm I'm trying to earn it. You can get an, you can have an assistant work hourly. You can do a, a tour manager. You can have stuff sent. You know, you can put on your rider so that when you get there, you got toothbrush. I mean, I literally, I mean, I used to go sh- grocery ride with my rider, but now I get there's a phone charger, toothbrush, toothpaste, toothpicks, this candle. It's sound, I'm not Jennifer Lopez. It's just these are the things I need to not be a manic mess. And that's have, good merch, by the way. What? I'm not Jennifer Lopez, but these are the things I need to not <laughs> be a manic It's just been like luggage, my luggage line. You know, so it's like I've been doing it long I'm enough. I'm feeling this being very in the weeds. So I just want to acknowledge, okay. I want to acknowledge that like, I really want to be hearing this. But your fans want you to go on tour. So I think they're going to like me bullying you to do this. Um, You can go to Disneyland and other places. Yeah, I'll, I'll drive. I, I'll drive place. I, if I could, as long as I could go home. Yeah. I want to be able to go home. I want to be able to be home because mm-hmm. this is where um, I, I want to be here. Yeah. I have, if my back hurts, I have the heating pads, I have the ointments. Do I have you, the what? right pillows. I have the right mattress. I have the comfortable clothes. Can I ask you a question? What happens when, um, uh, what gives you hope and, or a better question, do you lack hope on a daily basis just in humanity ever? You Maybe. just don't think about it? There's something about performing as a comedian that helps me believe in people because when you're like, oh, people come to sign up to feel joy. Whereas I feel like it discourages me to go on Twitter or whatever and see these people are just coming here to fight. They're coming here to spew vitriol. They're coming here to like call people busted cunts and just cause chaos. And when you go to a comedy show, you're like, all these people are paying money to feel good and think. And like, yeah, that's really romantic. I, I can keep going for another day. I'm, th- I'm very fortunate to have grown up with just play and laugh. Yeah, you already had love. And, yeah, yeah. And and you don't have to get love from strangers. Maybe you don't need to do this. Maybe you can do the hologram thing, the proto thing or zoom with your fans. I I love doing stand up. Yeah. In town. Come here. Come over why, here. Why don't you live stream your stand up shows at the Improv? I don't I don't even post I barely even post clips. I'm I Yeah. This is for now. Okay. 
I don't know. Why we're, am we're I managing you? Yeah, do what you want. Well, I am looking for a little inspiration because, like, I also know, and pardon me for saying this, if I want to get a house, I need to start doing live shows. Mm -hmm. I need to do that. So I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I just, I see you do, I want to, I want to be, I want to direct and write. Okay. I love acting and I love stand up, but yep. I want to make stuff, whether that's a special in whatever way I do it, I'm mm -hmm. a movie or a show. I love that. And I love doing it from home. Yep. I love doing it from home. But like I was saying, watching now my friends and peers graduate from uh, selling clubs to now theaters mm -hmm. and specials and truly believing for the first time as of as of last year, I'm like, oh, I'm good enough for that now. Yeah. I finally feel like I'm good enough for that now. And I feel like why, the reason I'm not doing why won't anybody give me an opportunity or yeah. what? I'd like, I, it's just like, I just have to go and do it. Yeah. And I just, and I don't understand why I'm not other than I don't want to. Yep. I'm not lazy. I don't think, I mean, I work really hard. I don't know if I work efficiently, but I'm always making and doing stuff. I just, yeah, I don't know. I just packing my bags and going traveling and, and doing it. I've just. I can't do it. But I just, I think for me, anything that I've struggled with, I always sublimate into work and then I'm able to get through it. So all I'm hearing is like the cold open of a show where you're like trying to get out the door and you can't because of all your shit. And it's like Larry David on the road. And everyone's got these complaints. You're mm -hmm. just better at it and and more sensitive. Better at it. You mean it's, it's you're more just, sensitive. Or yeah, and just really able to articulate it. And you have the the skill and the charisma and the career to be able to, I mean, most people are like, yeah, I want to bring all my shit, but I can't. So it's like, it's so relatable to be able to have these problems that, I mean, these are every, you know, it's like, I don't hear you saying anything that's like so yeah, yeah. unrelatable that it's not a show. It's like everything you're saying is an episode. I'm sorry. You know, and, you know, stepping outside of these fears and having to like go through the world so uncomfortable all the time, you know, it's like, you know, and to see a guy, because I think usually this is reserved for like, oh, she's a neurotic woman and she's being crazy and she's being obsessive and she's a hoarder. Like there's something so beautiful about seeing it through the lens of a man's eyes of being able to go like, this makes me uncomfortable and I don't want to do this. Like, it's just, it's interesting. It's compelling. I don't know why you are writing it. Um, I did. Um, and also now I'm soon, Oh, you know, I don't, I don't like talking, I don't talk about this stuff, but yeah. doing something with, and, yeah. and now I'm, I'm also feeling like now that I've, I have it at a play, we were pitching it. I booked a show. I couldn't, and then we're doing it again. Sure. Um, and now doing it again, I've, I've changed it up, but now I'm right. like, I do I don't like the idea of telling my story. Uh, by the way, I'm with you. I hate that shit too. Yeah, I did so, it so, and it makes it so personal, you know. And then people think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do but that. But it's, so, it's, it's easy. It's easy. So, it's easier. It's so much easier. And so you that's can kind of shoot it. You can shoot it like kind of more docu style, more like improvised. And, you know, you don't have to have 12 writers in a writer's room. The guild's going to shoot me in the neck for saying that. Um you know, or you can sort of just like shoot yourself on the road, you know, and do like a docu series type thing, which you talking is already as funny as most people writing. Do you want to always do stand up, even if if do you always want to stand up? Something weird happens when both of your parents die. When you're like, whose approval am I going for anymore? Wow, There's something yeah. really aimless about it. You There's, were going for theirs, I guess. After they died, there was a little bit of like, why am I going to the comedy store? at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday, <laughs> like who's this even for anymore? You know, I think a lot of it was, you know, yeah, trying to get their attention. I think I, my dad, the only, the, the only time I saw him laugh or the only time I, he would watch the TV. He loved Ronnie Dangerfield. He watched SNL. So I just, at a very early age, I'm not trying to make a joke. I just went, you have to get in the box. And I was just like, get in the yeah. box. And then my whole life was like, get in the box. That's how you're going to get them to see you. And it worked. Uh, and then, so now I'm just a little bit like, you know, whether it was, I was, doing something I thought would might piss them off or might get their attention. Or I just had so much pain and fear when they were alive and sick that I kind of just like my work addiction was. Did you th I think you were funny when you were starting? I've, I don't think I've ever been that funny a person. You don't think you're funny. I think I'm, I, I'm not like in it. I never was like, Oh, Wait, turn the cameras off. Okay. <laughs> okay. Also here, I'll put this away. Do so you think you're funny? I think I'm the funniest when I'm making a serious argument that's like ridiculous. Like, so yes, you think you're funny. I think I'm funny, but I'm not, but I wasn't trying. Like I would go to dinner with friends and be making a very serious point. You're, you're packing pillows and people would and laugh. traveling around the world to be funny. So you are trying. 
Yes, but I mean, when I before I started, you asked like when I started, I wasn't writing jokes yet. Right. I was like my actual real ideas made people laugh, and I was like I wasn't trying to make a joke there. And so the way I think is funny. I think so. People were laughing at things. You're know, like, oh, I could maybe be funny, and I'm like, but I'm not. I'm trying to be dead serious. Like I was gonna be a journalist. Like but what about when you wanted to be in the box, like Rodney Dangerfield? Well, I was like, just get in that box, however you can. Doesn't doesn't mean funny. Yeah, it just means I started get in the box. doing like dramatic theater and stuff when I was in high school and right. stuff. You know, because I was like, I don't really know, but I also Leslie. Nielsen is probably my favorite comedic actor and he was a dramatic actor that just played everything Speaking of serious. farting, have you seen his little fart machine stuff? No. <laughs> oh, there's great, I referenced it on one recently. He, he carries a fart machine with him all the time. Uh, there's, I've seen tons of clips of it. There's like one on, on talk Con- shows? Yeah, it was on Con- and he just farts and it just like Why am I laughing? He's, he is John John and I, DeWalt and I send Leslie Nielsen clips to each other constantly. I love John. Um, I also saw that- John they, Ritter I also love so much. They are, uh, I heard that Liam Neeson is the redoing Naked Gun with him. Interest, really? Have you seen- Him pee his pants in public? No. You haven't? Uh-uh. Really? I mean, I guess we'll pull up a clip, make it B-roll though, so we don't have to cut Not to a it. clip, it's just going to be photos of him taking photos with his fans with- um, Oh, piss? Pee. Did it start down here? No. I heard he has a Oh, why he has a giant. Isn't it weird that we can say that about God? Remember that whole Pete Davidson thing when women in Hollywood were like, he's got a big dick. I'm next. I'm next? I remember, like, I'm going to get that big remember, dick Remember, like, next? all these famous women were dating Pete Davidson and everyone was talking about how big his dick was? Yeah, I remember them dating him. I, I just get- think that's wild. Like... Imagine if someone's like Emma Stone's pussy's small. Like I don't. I heard that Emma Stone's pussy's like- small. <laughs> or tight. I've heard Emma Stone. I don't know. I just feel that's like how she got La La Land. I always thought that was weird when people was like, like people were like John Hamm's dick is huge, and like, I'm like, well, cool. Like I have that reputation. It's so fucking that so annoying. Would not surprise me. It's so annoying. Would not surprise me. But, um, wait. Oh, the 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 life's too. Sh- you know, life's too short. Ricky Gervais and Steve Merchant and Warwick Davis, the guy from Willow. It's a BBC show. Wait, this was the podcast they did? No, no. But that group. Yeah. But it's a BBC show and there's a, uh, I think well, I want to put a part of it. Improvisational comedy. I can't now, Liam. It's a bad um, let's do some improvisational comedy now. Why not? Come in. Hey. Hi, how's it going? What seems to be the problem? I've contracted AIDS. No, it's hel- it hilarious. That's like, oh, I could see him being do naked Do you know gun. how his wife died? I don't remember, but I... Dude, Natasha Richardson, this is why I have to do stand-up. Like, shit, like, I can't get over stuff like this when I hear about it. She went skiing, which I don't understand why anyone's ever skied in their life. Rich people, Darwinism. But she comes down the mountain. She falls, hits her head on the ski chalet outdoor floor, goes to sleep, doesn't wake up. Can you imagine? I don't want to. How could... I mean, how do you come back from that? Yeah, I don't want... I don't... See, <laughs> and this is what drives you to do stand up. I just mean like shit, bleak shit like that. I can't get over the randomness of like the universe, and I have to just like write silly, ha ha, good joke jokes. Do you think you're funny now? Uh, I think I'm funny as I've ever been as a stand up. If we were at your house during that when you were doing that screening thing, yeah, and then Whitney, come up here and give a speech. Uh, yeah, I think I think sometimes the more sincere you are, sometimes the funnier you are. But I'm I'm probably I, I don't feel the need to like prove myself when I'm not working as a stand-up or yeah. on stage you know i think i i and i yeah but it, it depends on who i'm with it depends on like what kind of vibe it is but i think sometimes if i try too hard to be funny it's like it comes off like gross so i tend to just like lean back excuse me i think there's an age that that stops being cute or something and i feel like i have to just like yeah all right well i mean this I have to pee and I could keep talking to you. And I I actually have so many questions. Really? And I as long as we can monetize it, so we could do this some <laughs> other other way some other time. Okay, did we get, I feel like we didn't get to many of them. Um, I mean, we're at like over two hours now. Okay. And uh, it sounds like your body is about to throw everything up. No, I know. Do you hear the gurgles and stuff? I know. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was my dad chewing for a second. I know. It's happened a couple times. You also have the microphone as close to your belly as you do your mouth. Well, no, if there's something about like when you're pregnant, it's just like pop. pop you hear like a pop. You're like, was that an abortion? Like, I don't know what just even happened. Things when just, did you start talking about this publicly, by the way? Uh, uh, five days ago. Yeah. Recently. Very recently. You said to me, you told me you were pregnant and I don't remember what I said, but you mm-hmm. said that was the more sane thing or something about referencing other comics say stuff. Yes. What do comics say? It's been wildly, you really find out how you're perceived when you tell people you're pregnant. Most people think I'm joking. 
Um, or they're like, you, what, how, how is the main one as in how is in, is your body allowed it? Or how is in you found a man? Don't know either. But also this is the first time I've been dating someone where it hasn't been public in some iteration. So I think people are also surprised. Is this public now? Yeah, I think so. And then, um, uh, a lot of people have said to me, they're like, look, being a single mom is it's hard. I hear it's hard. I'm right. like, what? Like, it's just, I think a lot of people assume that I had like paid a robot to Can I be honest? fuck me. What? I, I didn't know you even had a boyfriend mm -hmm. until after you told me you were pregnant. Right. So my thought was, yeah, of course you 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 bought it. And I talked about <laughs> added it to cart. I also publicly talked about freezing my eggs. So maybe, you know, that makes sense too. But yeah, I've been kind of shady about it. Because you never know if it's going to take, you know, there's all kinds. Of Are you going to be a person who, uh, when you post pictures, covers the baby's face? Yeah, I don't think I'm going to post pictures of the baby at all. But I think I would probably do that as my instinct right now. Right. You know? Even though all babies look the exact same for the first couple of years. Who you tell it. I've been saying that for Don't a week. Don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, for weeks I've been saying the same thing. Have you? No. I just, I'm just like a baby's a baby. But I think the issue is more not posting the background of your house is kind of the more important thing. If you're just like at a beach, you know, I think it's more about the safety. But also it's like the way that weirdos kidnap your kid. It's not that they know what your kid looks like necessarily. They're able to see the last nine places you were. Here we are at the ice cream parlor. Here we are at Disneyland. Here we are at, you know, um, uh, uh, Gymboree or Curves or whatever. And then someone comes up to your kid at school and it's like, hey, I'm Mark. Uh, we met at the Gymboree. Your mom, We, I saw you at Disneyland. I saw you at, uh, she told me to come pick you up. Yeah, let's go. I'll go home with you. And then all of that tracks. Cut to. Cut to. Yeah, I never thought of it from kidnapping. I just thought of it as like when the baby gets older, they're like, that was private. That's I didn't want my picture out there in the public. Yeah, but it's also it's like, remember when our parents would put like a picture of us on their desk at work? You know, it's like there's pictures of your kid everywhere. Yeah. You know, remember take your daughter to work day? My dad used to walk me around his office like in a schoolgirl outfit. <laughs> you know, it all it's all weird. But yeah, I do see myself probably, but I don't want to be annoying either. So I'll probably just not. Are you going to do a special where you talk about what it's like being a mom? I hope not. Do you really hope not? Unless it's interesting. I like, I'm not going to think that way. I'm going to think like, oh, if there's this one thing that what happened. What about doing that kind of special before it happens and then another one so you could like see if it worked out? Like, I'm going to guess what it's like to be a mom and I'm going to talk about being oh, a mom for a five of a five year old. And then you do it again once the kid hits five. Oh, that's really interesting. And I then you actually, intercut it. I wanted to do a, um, uh, mystery science theater for like my specials from the past and be like, I want to do it for my podcast, dude, it, just to be like, that is, I was so full of shit. That is so not true. I like, or just kind of like, I can't believe I believed that or just, I want to do a special called new dad. And it's going to come from the place where I am taught. I have a two year old son. I mean, I, I don't have a kid, but yeah. like do it from that mm -hmm. to where people actually think that I have a, and I'm just going to do what it's like and the perspective <laughs> I have of being a dad. <laughs> Is that okay? That's really funny. That's so weird. Is, yeah. that, is that okay? Yeah. It's probably, yeah, just like it does, you'll, it'll probably be. Could I tell you one thing that I have that, that it sounds so cliche, but yeah. it's like, and I've heard this a million times and I don't think you get it until it happens. Okay. Having my son, honest to goodness, it completely changed me. And I know that's corny and I know everybody says it, mm -hmm. living for somebody else. Mm -hmm. You don't realize how selfish you are until you can't be anymore. <laughs> you know, like having like those real strong takes and stuff. Even though it's just like every dad I know is more selfish. They're like, well, I have a kid. So they just think they're less selfish or something. I also see women differently since I had my little girl. Oh, little yeah. Little girl. She's eight now. Oh, my gosh. It's like every. Is it like every girl is someone's daughter? I look at. You know, what's interesting. Hmm. I don't just look at it like that. I look <laughs> at every woman as somebody's daughter. And I, I also look at every woman mm -hmm. as a future mother. Why do you look at so many women? I love them. <laughs> I love looking at women. Gun to your head. You're going to have a kid for sure. Boy or girl. I, well, I, I don't like that example. I always knew I was going to have a boy. I always. I used to think I wanted to have a boy because I wanted to play basketball with him. Mm -hmm. And now Girls that everything play basketball hurts. basketball too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they're also comics. No, the good ones are in prison in Russia. So um, they're also comics. But that's not what, you know, they were meant for. Um, <laughs> I I now go back and forth between whatever I'm happy, uh -huh. um, but I think I want a daughter and I'll tell you why. Ooh. I started realizing that because I want a dog and I've noticed the fact that you don't have a dog is wild. I don't have a I don't have a yard. You don't need one. Well, then I guess I'll go on the road, too. Yeah, you don't need one. Um, dogs like small spaces and they don't even need yards. 
I don't leave enough to be able, they need to be able to go outside. And other than taking them for walks, I don't think. Three I'll, times a day. They sleep most of the time. I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the market for a dog as I am of going on the road more consistently, which is like, I think it would be good for me. I just don't. A dog will change your life. You will be driving a daughter. So psyched. <laughs> no, um, I won't. Uh, wait. Oh, I, as I'm like, I, dogs are amazing. Obviously every, nobody doesn't like a dog unless there's a trauma. It's not about it. It's just about what will you, you, you no, I have a point to this. I have a point to this. Sorry. But four years ago, I mm -hmm. started, I became a dog person. Mm -hmm. Where like, I see a dog and I need to touch the dog and love the dog and play yeah. with the dog and let me watch the dog. I yeah, became yeah. a dog person and I've noticed, and I don't know if I'm right or not, I've noticed I have a different connection with girl dogs and boy dogs. Okay. I want a girl dog. Mm -hmm. And since I decided I want a girl dog, I've realized, oh, I want a daughter. Mm -hmm. So that's where that came from. Can I ask a weird question? And this is might sound like an insult. Do you like cats? Love Grew up with cats. I was going to say, you also might really love having a cat. So the reason I haven't gotten cats and I would have had them for years is because so many people are allergic. And I have, oh, I have people coming over. My I've bummer. Always, if I had a yard, I'd have a dog. If I had a podcast studio, I'd have cats. Ugh, Because I feel like cats are so smart and incisive. Love. They can read your room if you're, you know what I mean? Come on. Oh, God. See, I, I'm a dog. I have so many dogs. I don't think I could have a cat with where I live and stuff. But now as I get older, I'm kind of like, these things are just fucking aliens. Like, I just am fascinated by them. There's a lot of cats that are hypoallergenic. No such thing. Not completely, right? No. And you never. know what's interesting? It's the guy not who the invent fur, it's the, the saliva. It, correct. The guy that invented them, he wrote this whole article in the New York Times saying it was the biggest mistake of his life. He regrets it. Invented Stopped them. Stop breeding it. Yeah, he basically created, quote, hyperallergenic dogs. Well, like Siberian cats. He inbred them. Gotcha. It's, they're horrible. They have health problems. Are we talking about cats or the Jews? <laughs> they bite kids in the face. <laughs> you tell me. Um, yeah, so every every person in LA is like, I have a labradoodle because it's hypoallergenic. I'm like, did you just did you just not even Google Poodles this? Poodles are hyperallergenic though. Mm. It's just saliva. That's just cats. It's also just like no, it's dogs too. Gotcha. I always wanted it something with a poodle so it didn't shed. Yeah, poodles are really smart though. They're super cool dogs. Mm -hmm. I had a poodle growing up. If you don't cut it dumb, they're really smart. My mom thinks poodles are gross. She always did, and I mm -hmm. and I recently recently in the past few years I realized, oh my, I don't think my mom's ever seen what a poodle looks like. And I pulled up a picture of a poodle and she thought they were great. I, people think poodle is the way it's cut. Yeah, the way, yeah, that's their hair. What they're a weird they're thing. actually very cool, but Labradoodle, those things, they have so many health problems. You know, they snap anything that's too inbred. You just don't want anything that's too inbred. Same thing happening to German Shepherds. Like, this is. German Shepherds are inbred? So inbred. And their back legs, they start, start to get hips dysplasia very young. They're like. I think I found our cold open. <laughs> No, I'm like, if you want to hear more about <laughs> hip dysplasia of a German shepherd. People care about dog stuff. I don't know. People kind of like this esoteric shit, I feel like. Um, <laughs> I still have uh, for another time, but I just have, you're somebody I have so many questions really? for. Yeah, that we touched about a little bit and I loved it. But like, if we were to do this again, mm -hmm. on mine at least, I want to I want to play more games with you where we write scenarios. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it's just this, this is, we got to wrap it up. You mean we'll write a show? Um, I mean, if, I'm, yeah, that's that, kind of my thing. Yeah. If that were a thing, that would be great. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but like even you, you, you saying loves Batman, but only the Michael Keaton version or the Christian Bale, whatever you said, right. um, made me so is a I want to hear so many more of those that's my how I that's my thing yeah I think that could be my thing yeah I mean that 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 thing but once you get that template in your mind you're like oh I know how I now I know how to do this because I feel like so much of us read bad vague scripts that we're like I guess I have to write a bad vague script and once someone just gives you permission to go like no 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 even the stage direction can be relentlessly interesting and what we have learned descriptive words are were written by people that wrote shows that we don't even like. So it's like really going like, why am I making a bad version of a thing that I already read? Like, why don't I just do my version of this? We're comics. We think differently than anyone. You have such a unique brain. Make your script like incredibly unique. I know joke structure very well. Um, and I have, I can't say every episode, but I'll say 50 episodes of Curb. I yep. have pause. I write down every beat. Mm -hmm. And what I've realized that my understanding of what a TV show is is surrounds a single person. 
and sure. I can, and I am now trying, and I'm I'm not reading stuff because I hate reading stuff. So maybe I'm but, but I'm watching f- so many pilots of shows that are ensemble based, or I just rewatched uh, the Ray Romano show. Uh, oh, it's so good! Everybody loves Ray. No, oh. um, final. What I? Oh, the one that Chuck Lorre did. No, Ray Romano. <laughs> Men of a certain age. Oh, right, right. And there's three, Ray's the main, there's three people. And and I've realized it almost like it's another language. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't surround one person, I'm really struggling with it. Right. And I, anything I've acted in has not, like I've read a fair amount of, it's never just one person, but I only know how to write Curb. Interesting. Because it's like, do you not want to commit enough to the other characters being fully fleshed out? No, no, no. I would love to. I don't know where their place is structurally. Mm-hmm. Like- I love I love settings. St- I love when everything comes together. Sure. So it's like then you, then you just could do A story, B story, C story. So you're doing three curbs in one show. But when B story is is not connected to A story, has to be. I, oh, great. Has to be. Has to be. Well, then I have what I've been. Then I'm missing how I see on television when it is. So then it's I often not. And I feel like that what helps I think our brains are a little bit similar I think what would help you is to go okay so let's say our our main character Rick a story in season one he's gonna get a new camera set up because th- this camera keeps going out that's one of his big issues he has to go to whatever Radio Shack or f- whatever Circuit City whatever and deal with his camera setup both Remember, of which are Dennis Joden Rivers but go on which <laughs> And then, and then I know Radio Shack is just an actual shack now. Yeah. The fact Everyone that- would believe that you're 21 until you go to Circuit City or <laughs> I don't know, whatever. But Comp I, USA. But I need her to go to a store. I need Rick to go to a store. Best I, buy. We can't just the only go one to, that's left. We can't just go to Amazon and you know call. How about he needs to return it? And the store he bought it at was a Radio Shack and it's closed, right? So we need some kind of conflict of why you know he's not going to be able to do it. Number two, he's going to get a cat. Okay, let's say whatever. Number that's B story. No, these are all A stories for him down the line. We're going to just put five A stories. Oh, we're talking about a season, not an episode. In a list. We're going to put, but, but this is going to get us one episode. Even if we don't, if you don't have have these in the season, let's just say you have, you know, five of these. And then uh, 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 Rick is going to go to Pensacola. Rick needs to buy new luggage because he's going to Pensacola, right? So there's, there's four. And then we're going to go. Cat, f- camera, Pensacola. Great. So you just What's have four uh, uh, going to Pensacola, going to the luggage store to buy stuff for Pensacola, maybe um, I gotta, gets I a go new on, therapist, whatever, A stories. And then you're going to do Brett Morin, Brett's A stories, Brett. Brent. Brent, sorry. <laughs> believe, believe what you said, Brett, the first two times. Sorry. You go, love Brent, love I'm, Brent. I'm, like, you know, I know we both have to pee and I'm trying to get this you, out really you, quickly. You saying you love Brent, but calling him Brett is saying you're a big fan of my podcast and asking if there's cameras. Go on. Right. <laughs> It's just when he wears Whitney, that. the person is just when he wears loves, that beanie, he is a Brent. Okay. <laughs> Let's be honest. So then, uh, Brent. Okay, so Brent going through a breakup. Brent um, uh, gets kicked out of his apartment. Brent um, uh, realizes he gets called out for wearing beanies, so now he has to find a new style. Great. Right. Then I'm going to go. Which of these could intersect possibly? Okay, so I'm just going to look at all these options. And I'm going to go. Okay, Brent just went through a breakup. Okay, he's single now. He's looking for a girl. Rick is looking for a cat. Yes, looking for a girl. And then, or maybe he goes to Circuit City with, there's a girl at Circuit City that he goes on the, you know, then you start being able to like start weaving things together and then going, okay, now all of a sudden I know how these are going to In an episode, what's the A story? What's the B story there? A story is going to be for whichever ones you found a connection with. You go, oh, wouldn't it be funny if the person that he was dating or had just gone through a breakup with. But there's two things. Rick's goes to Best Buy, Brent's, Brent, Brent goes with Brent's looking for a new girl. Mm-hmm. Those could happen at the same time. Which one of them is the A story? I like better really quick. I go Brent's girlfriend moved out and left the cat. And then she's like, can you take this cat? And it's like, no, I don't want your cat. Mm-hmm. And I don't want your haunted fucking ass cat mm-hmm. or whatever. And he tries to pawn the cat off or something like that. So it's a little bit, you know, connected Understood. or too connected in a way. Um, so then you'll go, here's the A story that I like, or you'll go, I want to do this one. And then you go to all the other A stories for everybody else that might match up. And then you're going to go, so this, oh, this will be a B story for him. Understood. And then ideally you'll dovetail at the end right. and they'll all pay off with each other. But it's like a little bit of a, a Rubik's Cube game. I get it. You know, so then so then you let your brain make the connections. It's almost like, you know, when you have uh, you need to take your 20 minutes and put it into a eight minutes for some reason. And then you're like, how do I segue from this joke to this joke? And then the segue is almost like a new joke. So it's like making set, se- you know, picking B stories and then C stories that serve the A story. Yeah. And then that way you're writing three A stories in a way. So you don't feel like you're just writing. That's how you're able to like do your ensemble. 
You'll find the ones that like have I'm gonna, links. I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm going to want to ask you more questions. But as, when I reduce it to math, my brain really is able to figure things out. Yeah, I, I think I, your brain is a little bit like that yeah, too. Yeah, because when I because I know how to combine stories together, um, but they've all been from a they've all been from this person. I have I need a cat. I need to go to Pensacola, and mm -hmm. I, you know I I I, I want to buy a house. I could find stories that involve people in that and having those come together. Mm -hmm. But the I, I want to better understand other people's stories and how they could come with mine. And yeah. I guess that's just coming up with their stories. Yes. And then just, but you don't even need to come up with, just go like, here's 10 things that would be that's funny to see this character do this season. And then you start just getting links. You start going, oh, this person needs a new place to live. Oh, he's getting a house. Oh, what if he tries to get in on this? How is he going to make this more of an obstacle for this person? Oh, this person needs something that this person has, when, et cetera. When, uh, when you have, I think this is last question, you have uh, B and or C stories. Um, when you go, an ensemble show and you're going to the next, I mean, we're, we're focusing on this story, then this story, and then back to this story, you know, one, two, one, two, one, two, or something. Okay. Or A, B, A, B, A, B. Do you, when do you need to like, we're going to focus on Whitney. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to focus on Rick. Yeah. Now we're going to focus on Brent. Yeah. Here's where they come together. Mm -hmm. But when you're going between this person, this person, this person, do you feel like you need to have, a balance of, well, we just did Whitney last one. So now we have to write something for this person. Sure. Sure. That if you're in hell, that is what ends up happening. When you you're know? in hell, you mean if people I think are that's hell, controlling you. Cause then you're si trying to serve a character instead of a story. Correct. So a lot of times, you know, if you're in season two of a show and you're like, well, we need to give this person a line that you never want to be there. Cause then you're serving actors, you're serving characters. Like no one is like, Oh, I, this scene's like kind of fine, but I'm glad they're at least, Giving this person screen time, no right. one cares. I think it's like you just have to give the story what it deserves. And that's where rewrites come in. You just go like, I tried to make this work. This is actually just going to be a half a scene instead of one scene. Uh -huh. Like no one's going to miss any jokes that they didn't know weren't written in the first place. So it's like, that's where the art of it comes in, which is like your style. As I an, feel very inspired right now. As an auteur, you're going to make those decisions. The key is that it's satisfying, but you're going to cut the story off as soon as you're giving too much story away. Uh -huh. You know, that's when you're going to cut it off. You're giving too much away. Give an example. So it's like if there's a, you know, we, also, sorry if this isn't we're done soon and you don't have to. But if you like this stuff, stick around. I think people like TV. So I don't know. Maybe um, I think that as soon as something stops feeling satisfying or you're giving too much away or you're feeling what's self, an example of giving too much self indulgent, away? you're going um. Okay, so the reveal needs to be that You're literally giving a reveal away is all you mean. Yeah, it's like, or you need to create some tension or some mislead, right? So it's always sunny in Philadelphia. You got to go like, okay, so we need to think that D is gonna get this job, and if the person that already has the job she thinks she's getting comes in, now we know and says this, we are, we're too ahead of it. Copy. So that's when you cut. The I'm this to be an interesting conversation. conversation. Yeah. So you want to be able to like tease the audience and sense. you know what I'm saying? So it's like, that's when the scene is over. Yeah. You know, when the audience starts getting ahead of it, okay. you know? So it's like, the idea is like, you know, don't end the show before you end the show. So it's like, how long are you? It's like teasing. It's like foreplay. It's like, how long am I going to mislead this? How long am I going to take him this way? And when does this thing stop being funny? I mean, I, but also look at a show like baskets, which I love. Never saw. I heard it's great. Oh my God. It is so worth watching because it like puts an end to any conversations of like, this is self-indulgent or this isn't serving the story. Like that'll, you know, I'm a hypocrite when I say that because then I go like baskets. It's like, you know, it's more of like a character study in a lot of ways. So you see him ordering from a fast food restaurant and he just keeps ordering weird sodas. He's like, I'll take this and this and a fresca. And they're like, we don't have fresca. And he's New like, girl did that a bit. I love okay. when they're, when they're just... They're just runs of jokes. There's just runs of jokes and they're just letting characters live. Sure. That's not story. Sure. It's just like, this is funny. We're getting to know these people. Dramas do it all the time when they like they give an episode to somebody who is small and they're just yeah. like meeting this person's world. Rami Comedies did that don't well. really do it. Yeah. Rami did that well. But it's also you have to care about the character enough to be able to sit through it. And there has to be some kind yeah. of dramatic engine, you know, and it's like if it's funny enough, all the rules. Should are I watch the baskets or rewatch the comeback? <sighs> That's tough. I would definitely want. I want to rewatch. We have the comeback. to choose. I want to rewatch the comeback, but I've seen it. And, uh, and you've seen season two. 
I've seen one and two years and years ago. I definitely uh, Rami is excellent and Baskets is excellent. Baskets is like I love rewatching stuff though. It, Baskets is so weird. You do. Oh yeah. I like rewatching stuff. And sometimes I get annoyed because I'm like, how did I forget about this? Like, how did I, you sure. know? But um, you know, I'll shut up and blathering. But Baskets is is excellent. All right, let's go pee. Okay, but before I, we go pee, I have to take a Polaroid. Or do you want to go pee first? Um, why don't I pee and then we'll do that? I'll go pee I upstairs. Make sure, I'm not like a total raccoon face. Yeah, I'll be From right back too. Oh, um, I also, I forgot to ask how rude of me, and we could find a way to put this in. But when when your boyfriend inseminated you, did you come? That's why I got pregnant. Is the first. Um, uh, <laughs> I feel the need for everyone to hear this because uh, it's the first time you came. For the first time I've ever had an orgasm and conceived, wow. but that's how you get pregnant. It's is having orgasm. I heard it helps. Yeah, it can, that's yeah, but also uh, he came and then had orgasms after, and also staying laying down. Is no, thing. no, I'm sorry. And this is the cold open. So, <laughs> so Shit. he came and then you orgasmed after. He can still have sex after. He comes for some reason for for a long time or for a little bit. Blue Chew promo code Whitney. I don't for like a, a long time. I mean, did you he know. have a second come? <laughs> no, I don't. Th I don't know. You guys are shady about that stuff. Who's you guys? You just all of you. I never know. What do you mean? Well, because sometimes you're having sex with a guy and you're, they're like, "I came already," and you're like, "What? When? Huh?" Oh, like, I will. I, I will always let somebody. How know would before. I not have known that? Don't he? I will never know what's going on with him. He's very like private about it. <laughs> You don't know when he comes? Normally you're able it to- It sounds like he's an introvert. There's usually like, a, or something at least. And he's just- Oh, I always ask permission. Oh. You don't mind if I come real quick, do you? <laughs> well, I like, I, I like just, I'm about to come, but he gives me no yeah. warning. And then, no. And then afterwards- So he just, he just- <laughs> That's insane. It's kind of wild. Don't you want the person to know? Yeah, and I'm tr trust me, we're still Bring him in here. getting to know each other. Trust me, I have so many questions. But then he is very into me having an orgasm, which I have not really been with a guy who's like, that's their kink. And so after he comes, I'll be laying down and then I'll have orgasms. And then- Now, how does Whitney Cummings orgasm? Uh, I'll use my hands or he'll use his hands. Right, or... it's clitorally stimulated yes. for you. Yes. yes, that's normally the one. So, so- the inside ones and the all that is kind of a myth. It's not a myth. But you have to rub against the clip. It depends. Not, not, every, not everybody yeah. is that way. Okay. And that is more common. And if anybody knows vaginas, it's, it's I'm sure there's somebody out there. This guy. A lot of women, but usually, myself included, used to fake them, and it's very hard without some kind of clitoral stimulation. Yeah. So 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 he, you'll use your hand, or he'll mm -hmm. use a hand, or perhaps a vibrator. Yeah, I don't use vibrators too much. Anymore? I don't need more. It's like another thing to charge. It's like, it's a hassle. That's a strong I, I actually never used one until for the first time, like a year and a half ago, maybe the first time I ever used one. Do you ever get in a position to where maybe not so much when you with your boyfriend now, but when you're with somebody and you're in your head about like, I, I need to come. So then you get, you're not, you're not present anymore. I don't with him, but I, I used apologize. to be. I'm just going to turn the fan off. No, please. Oh, sorry. That was probably me. I just, oh, the fan and the light are the same thing. I don't think about it with him because he's so into it and I feel very secure with him. But in yeah. the past, I definitely used to be like, I have to come or else he's, like, but what if I fake it and now I'm not breathing? And then, you know, but I stopped lying about orgasms a while ago. Like in my twenties, I would just kind of fake it. Lying about orgasms is people pleasing and mm -hmm. it's a selfish act. Agree. And we do it not because we don't want to hurt the other person's feelings, but we're afraid of how we'll feel in that conflict. And I think as a PSA, women, Keep faking your orgasms, <laughs> and men, it's not now. It's not their fault. But I'll ask after. I'll say, I'll say, what, what can I do better? And then she'll it's say, it's her responsibility to tell you, though. Yeah. Also, and also, what everyone can do better is like you have to be breathing. This like <gasps> you can't have an orgasm that way. Like you gotta be I'm like sorry. truly calm. What, what, what are you just doing? Because maybe I haven't been having sex right. Or do, are, are some women getting fucked and going? <laughs> I <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I just mean I feel like I used to try so hard to perform sexually and sort of be that, acrobatic. You know what? You're not talking about sex. I, talking I, this is gonna sound corny. Maybe I shouldn't say this. All right, fine. You're gonna say it. You're just talking about being present, baby. I'm talking about being present, baby. And whether you're having sex mm -hmm. or whether you're having a conversation. Or whether you're eating. Those are the big three. I will be talking and realize that I haven't breathed in minutes. 
you know? So I think it's like really about like breathing and not trying to impress the person and being okay with having seven shins and six veins coming out of your forehead. And like, you get extra chins when you're looking ugly. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. When you're, is that what you, when you're coming, it can be intense. It's not always pretty to look at. How come you never got pregnant before? Whitney speak on that. I got pregnant when I was a teenager. Handled it. What does that mean? Handled it. Had an abortion when I was 16, I think. Who paid for it? Um, my mom, not the guy. So Bloomingdale's, thank you. Bloomingdale's? She worked at Bloomingdale's. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I didn't know they were aborting. <laughs> Bloomies. Yeah, no. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. So who knows? But why didn't you get pregnant since? I was on birth control because I had really bad migraines. Um, and so I was just always on birth control, which I think was like very bad for me mentally. I know now is not the time to like be like birth control is bad with what's you going on. You know what? I, I, I'm going to go out there and say it. I think birth control, I mean, it serves a purpose. I think yeah. that you need to really question whether or not it's worth it. It tells your body that you're pregnant. I mean, you are behaving as, you know, you're more, in my case, it was more emotional, hypervigilant. I mean, I had kind of like a manic episode in in January. My mom had just died, obviously. Um, uh, you know, so there was a lot of grief involved, but I went off birth Your control. mom just died this January? Yeah, December, December. So I was like, I don't yeah. know why it seemed like that happened a long time ago. She had a stroke a really long time ago and she was in a bed for- 10 years nightmare and then my dad died you know so it's been a lot of tragedy stuff but I went off birth control entirely I went off Prozac um probably shouldn't have gone off so many things cold turkey but then I was dealing Are you with not taking anything now no nothing zero zero I well, you heard it here first Whitney Cummings has a lot of chins when she comes <laughs> I was prescribed five milligrams of slow release Adderall to sleep <laughs> to sleep yeah because I guess they say if you truly have either a mania or OCD, it actually calms you down. Adderall, I think for most people, they take it to as like speed. But for me, I guess- it focuses something? Yeah, I guess. But then they told me, I found out later that that was like a placebo dose because it was intended for kids. So I don't know. Placebo, Five milligrams ain't nothing. But yeah, placebo works on me really well. I think it's like a great medication, but I went off of birth control. I could not believe how much energy I had. I was just like manic. I was like seeing things more clearly. I was like smelling things. Like I just was like, I can't believe I've been on birth control this long. Like, you know, I've experienced um, in two relationships, them being both on and off birth control. Whoa. And it it's it's like this is dangerous, man. Yeah, dude. And also they always say that if someone's on birth control when you're with them before you get married or engaged or have a kid together, you should go off it for at least a year to make sure you're still attracted to the person because you smell pheromones differently. Huh. You're attracted you, to a different the thing. The woman being attracted to the man or the man being attracted to the woman? Uh, I would imagine it. I'm sure it goes both ways. Uh, but uh, woman you? attracted to a man. Whoa. And then the way she behaves off it, I'm sure we'll decide whether you're attracted yeah. to her or not. Like live with somebody before you marry them exactly and also right. see them off birth control. Correct. And then was it a good thing or a bad thing when they were off oh, of it? Oh, both times good. When they went off of it, yeah. they were more manageable hormonally. Um, yeah. I'm speaking from a point of just them being a happier person, not uh -huh. the way, not their behavior, mm -hmm. just them well, think oh, about it. When you're, so about it. when you're pregnant, you're going to be more hypervigilant. You're going to be more suspicious. You're going to be more paranoid. I'm, that's start, I'm starting a podcast with Esther. It's sick. And i um, very excited about it. I mean, it's already out now. Rick and Esther have a time. Um, but uh, one of the sponsors is a, a, a Plan B pill. Julie. And my... It's not that big of a deal, but she's... It is a big deal. Oh, sorry. It's um, annoying. Just phones or toilets. Um, uh, <laughs> one of the, th it, it, uh, the issue we, we do, uh, we sell stuff. People know yeah. I'm selling you a product. Of course. I don't need to be like, Oh, this is my favorite bubble gum. Yeah. I'm going to, but also it has to be something I would use and have used and or okay with or whatever. Sure. And I have a very strong, I mean, is it my place to say, but yes, also if I'm selling something, sure. uh, I've also been around some plan B experiences Okay. and what that does to a person, um, mm. both. Also, just friends that I know that have taken it. Sure. Um, and I think people think of it as kind of just like, oh, I, I could always just take a plan B. And I it, it fucks people up so much. Never in my life. I've never, had a, plan, I've never had a plan B in any part of my life. I have a, fr a, a friend right now. She's a comedian mm -hmm. um, uh, who told me that like something has been going on. And she told me she, she just took a plan B and she's been fucked for weeks. Because it just mentally, hormonally. It's, yeah, you're. You're putting hormones into your body to trick it into. Its well, it also used to be that you could take like five birth control pills and it would do the same thing. There were all these weird little hacks. But what? Since when do guys in LA come inside you? They come on your face. I thought. That's really sweet. That was. 
<laughs> like I am not, that was not my experience in Los Angeles. But yeah, I do, I do know a lot of girls who are just like, you know, I guess I'm just taking, and they stress out the ne- day after and their whole day is stressed. And like, does he split it? And, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, I just split would never, it. who's going to pay for the plant? They're like 50 bucks. I don't know what the Julie one is. I don't you know? either. I just know that like, I felt, I, I feel, I, I feel a little weird about that one, about sponsoring that one. And I feel like I'm going to oh. have to say something that it was also as a man, it, um, like, hey, also, I see how this is a value to you, but just like really be careful because this is going to fuck you up a little bit. There's a good chance it will. Like, could I say that? And I, that's the only way I'll. No, I mean, I think also just the stress of going, what if I'm pregnant? That'll fuck you up too, you know, or getting pregnant by someone that you don't want to have a but kid do with. People that'll know, fuck you up too. Do people kn- I think if people knew how much, I bet you statistically that those women that have taken plan B once uh-huh. now think differently about unprotected sex. I, it's, I've not had that experience, but I do think it probably causes like resentment with the person. I mean, yeah. maybe a little bit of shame. Again, it costs money. I don't know why people aren't just swallowing cum. You know, they're going to mark that for a cold so open. So we did in my day. I don't know. It just seems like a lot of s- sex coming in vaginas. Like we know how babies happen. It happens when you don't do it. A, a friend. I know, a but you just say name. like, come on my tits or say, come on but my people, butt. I, a friend of mine has a, has a son and he pulled out. Uh-huh. Still, still goes in. Uh huh. There's still some. You gotta semen. stand up right away. What? What? You can't just lie down, lie there. And That's chat. why I've always said, if you don't want to get a girl pregnant, make sure she doesn't She's come. She's got to get up right away. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Rick Glassman. We'll put up Whitney's tour dates right here. And uh, when the baby is born, we'll um, you'll send a picture. We'll put a star over his. It'll face. be on OnlyFans. I'm yeah. live streaming it. Oh, uh, let me get that Polaroid. Scoot do. Blabbity blue Scoop D Oh yeah